Mm-hmm. So, uh, generally in Buddhism, we begin by taking refuge. We can take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, the Guru, the deities, the Dakinis, the Dharmakaya, the Sambhogakaya, the Nimanakaya. Uh, these are all names. Basically, we take refuge in the mind. We have a mind. Buddha, we don't know where he is. <laughs> Sangha, maybe reliable, maybe not. But anyway, you have a mind. <coughs> Do you take refuge in your mind? Probably not. We just heard that plans are being made. This is taking refuge in the content of the mind, in thoughts, intentions, concern how to manage situations and that's our human situation that's what we do most of the time and it helps to keep our lives safe we rely on thinking on conceptual clarity on rationality on research data formulations all of which helps to manage the complex patterning of the relative situation. As we were looking yesterday, each of these thoughts and feelings and sensations that we rely on are semantically relatively reliable. That is to say that their manifest content allows us to step forward on the basis of this We can do that on the basis of testing. We see that people have COVID and therefore some action has to occur. So you have a sequence of related activities, some of which are internal, some of which are external. But this is not the mind itself. So our key concern in the practice of Mahamudra is to see that what arises in the mind is not separate from the mind. And although there is more impact from what is arising in the mind, you feel a sensation in your body, you feel feelings, you're aware of thoughts and how they could direct your embodied presence. And the mind itself, ungraspable, invisible, beyond conceptualization, easy to forget. And yet, it's the basis. Just as in the traditional example, you have the ocean and the waves. When you look at the ocean, you see the waves. You don't see the depth of the ocean. But it's the volume of water that allows these waves to arise. If you just had a a puddle, a, a shallow pond in a field, Even if the wind was blowing strongly, you would get very small waves. But it's the depth of the ocean that allows these great pulsations to travel through. And from that, you get the wave. Without the ocean, no waves. Without the mind itself, no movement of the mind. So it's not that you have to stop the movement of the mind to see the depth of the mind. Yesterday we looked uh, a little bit at one way of understanding uh, Mahamudra in relation to Zagge, depth, profundity and expansion, vastness. And these two are inseparable. The depth, ungraspable, in the manifestation Vast, which also means like differentiated, many different forms, moment by moment. So, wherever we are here, whatever we are caught up in, whether we're talking with people or walking alone or doing some yoga, whatever you do, this is a movement of the infinite mind. And when you see directly that this movement arises from the mind as the mind, then the duality of invisible and visible, 
non-existent and existent starts to dissolve for you. So we take refuge in the mind itself, not by changing the outer forms of our life, but just gently relaxing our intoxication with the seeming importance and validity and necessity of tracking the waves, because they are impacting us and we turn this way and that, something is happening. The something that is happening is always nothing. <laughs> nothing is the only ha happening allowed. It's the only happening possible. Every something is nothing. That's the teaching of the Heart Sutra. It's the teaching of all the higher tantras of Mahamudra and Sokshen. Somethingness for us is our sense of self or ego. Uh, ego means I, of course, and in the Tibetan tradition as well, they say Dag, Dag, which means I. I, but it also refers to a tree or a car. It also means um, something there, something existent, something which seems to have within it its own ground or basis. So the basis of me acting is me. I, I, this is why I am. This is what I do. So it is as if my energy arises from some <clears throat> basic foundation in myself, some irreducible essence. This is the substantial sense of self. I am something. I am someone. I exist. And I exist as me. I am an entity apart from the situation. I am an isolate. I am isolated by the integrity of myself. I mean, take, with that, I am isolated from the factors around me because there are two aspects of my experience, me and not me, self and other. This is our usual conceptualization. So when this arises, I, It has nowhere to go. We have to have I am, or I want, or I need, or I'm not going to. That's not a complete statement. I'm not going to what? I'm going to what? There has to be some object out there. We are relational. And this is the key thing to see. Just as the wave is inseparable from the ocean, as a non-duality. So I am inseparable from the environment also as a non-duality. There is no self without the other because we breathe in, we breathe out, we eat and shit, we talk, we hear, we are moving and pulsating. So although we conceptualize an enduring self-substance which exists on its own terms, this is exactly a deluded conceptualization. This is the basis of samsara, that the idea of being separate is the basis of separation. I is an idea. It's something which arises and vanishes as the pulsation of emergence and dissolving, which is ceaseless, less like the waves in the ocean. <laughs> but if there is a fixation on the wave, a particular wave, how would you separate a wave? You have to find some way of identifying this wave to distinguish it from that wave, because the waves are just coming with the same substance, which is water, which is the depth. No wave has a separate self-substance, but it has an individual form. So this is the heart of the, the Heart Sutra that we touched on yesterday. 
form is emptiness, you could say form is a form of emptiness. Uh, sensation and emptiness, sensation is a mode or a showing of emptiness. Emptiness is like the great ocean, but this is a metaphor. This is not pointing to some metaphysical substance. Emptiness is not a substance. It is the, the medium of showing, just as the emptiness of the mirror is the medium through which the reflections arise. If the mirror wasn't empty, it couldn't show. So the, uh, the medium has these three aspects we looked at yesterday, empty, clear, and precise. The manifestation of compassion or connectivity is just this, just this, as you relate and talk to different people. Open, clear, just this. Each wave is like that. The wave itself is open because it doesn't have any anything to separate itself from the ocean. It's clear because it has no internal substance that would separate it from the ocean. And it is precisely just this, because when you look at the sea and you see the waves, each has their own particular intensity. Some catch the wind and bubbles come on the top. Others are just more like rolling and rolling. So this is how we are in the world. We have our energetic formation for a while in this situation. Mm. So self is a false interpretation of what is going on. Do we need to have a correct interpretation? No. We need to have no interpretation. When we have this word clarity, uh, in the Tibetan, uh, they say wusa, meaning clear light or luminosity. It, it means uh, the immediate thisness of something. If you go for a walk in the fields, everything's a little bit burnt and dry, but every now and then you see a little flower, a little yellow flower. You see the, oh, oh. In that moment, you get everything. If you know the Latin name of the flower, you insult it. This is a colonial gesture. You take the flower and you pull it into the human frame of reference. The flower doesn't need your concept. The flower gives you the gift of freeing your mind from concept in that moment of surprise. Oh, oh. You hear the cuckoo in the forest. Oh, oh. Mine's a little empty. Hedewa, shocked open. Oh. Then this rolling machine <laughs> of conceptual interpretation starts rolling and you become so powerful. Like the farmer roaring down the road in his tractor. <laughs> so it's not that self doesn't exist at all. It exists as a mode of emptiness. It's a wave in the ocean. You, you don't need to get rid of yourself. It's just a form of wave. If you see it's a wave of the ocean, its delusion is dissolved because the deluded part of the self and its deluding power for us is its claim for autonomy, separate identity. I am what I am. But what you are is a wave in the ocean. No, I am me. I am me is a wave of the ocean. Sun <clears throat> arises and vanishes. Silence, sound, silence. Ocean, wave, ocean. It's just moving all the time. So this is why we are, a focus of our attention is non-duality. Don't slice the manifesting form from its own ground. What came in my mind is I have a friend and 
Sometimes you go and eat a pizza together and she doesn't like so much uh, on the pizza. She always takes a knife and she scrapes the <laughs> topping off onto one half and cuts this dead half to do it. <laughs> That's a particular way of eating, but I don't know what the chef thinks. <laughs> so this is what we are doing. We said we want this tasty bit and we don't want the crap. Mm? I want existence. I don't want non-existence. It's fattening. <laughs> but existence and non-existence are joined. They are not. We often see binaries as polarities, and we'll come on to that when we look more in the structure of Mahamudra. So we say high, low, good, bad, and these are mutually exclusive polarities. If it's high, it's not low. If it's hot, it's not cold. It's either or. And yet, there is no high without low. There is no hot without cold. You need the opposition between the concepts to establish the truth of the concepts. So they are conceptually separated, but existentially interdependent. So the binaries are not structurally independent, they are only semantically separated by poor conceptualization. So whenever we say, oh, it's a very hot day, we can see on the roof, they have these little racks for the snow, so it doesn't tumble down on people's heads too much. So that would indicate it also gets cold here. In the rooms they have heaters and a big fire for the wood. We don't want it just now, but it's hot in the summer, cold in the winter. It's a bit cold in the morning, it's hot in the afternoon. These are pulsations of the, of the potential of the situation. And we are aware of all of this, or rather we are conscious of all of this, because the ground of our mind is an awareness which is like an open theatre stage within which moment by moment the scenery is shifting, the characters are shifting, the drama is shifting. The stage is always open. Any drama can be staged and it's always staged on the space of empty awareness. A thought arises, an identification arises, a feeling tone arises. That's a movement on the stage. And then it shifts, and then it shifts. So this is our life, endless dramas, endless interactions, endless unfolding of the potential of the ground. The more you see everything which arises is not you doing it, but that you are participating as a movement in movement and that movement is inseparable from stillness and movement is inseparable from the pure ground, you are a wave in the ocean, a wave moving with other waves. So when we say, I take refuge in the mind, this is what it is. Just saying it won't do us any good. We have to open to movement and allow movement to show us its emptiness. So, for example, you look in the mirror, think, oh, that's me. <clears throat> so, not, not only do you see your own face, but you see something behind it. So you go for a walk with the mirror in front of you, <laughs> and face seems to change not so much, but the scenery around it is changing. How is this possible? I mean, because the mirror is empty. The mirror is hospitable. So, since you woke up this morning, you've already had many, many experiences of the body, of the environment around you, of people, of eating food, 
of getting your body ready to come here. This is reflections in the mirror. These have been moments of experience which were undeniably there, tasting the coffee, or eating the breakfast. Oh, mm, yeah, this, and then go. Just like the reflection in the mirror. Now, the thing about the mirror is you never ever see the empty mirror. The reflection comes because the mirror is empty. On the outer level, you need some deductive logic. I couldn't have so many reflections if the mirror was full of its own stuff, like a painting. What we want to do is to enter the state of the mirror so that as our experience is arising, it's precisely on the point of here and now, the only point where we actually exist. So we're not conceptualizing by thinking about what has happened or what might happen, or even doing a commentary about what's going on now, but we rest in the space of experience. In that space, we don't find my true self as something. It's not like that. The emptiness of the mirror is inseparable from the reflection in the mirror. So the creativity of the mind is the emptiness of the mind. And the emptiness of the mind is the creativity of the mind. Because it's empty, nothing is created. And yet, you can't deny that experience is occurring. So, the best way to take refuge in the mind itself is to do the practice. So we can do, start with just a little open sitting practice. Allow the skeleton to carry you. Uh, usually for this kind of practice, do it with your eyes open. You can have them closed as you like. The key thing with non-dual meditation practice is there isn't a rule because you're not trying to align yourself with a template. If you were visualizing a mandala, you get often a very precise description of the mandala and the color of the deity's cheeks and so on. Here, we are simply opening to how it is. And how it is, is not established in some factory in the future that's sending us a message. It's just this, nobody can know how it will be. So, for the meditation practice, you see how it is. If your eyes are open, it's like this. If they close, it's like that. Either way, experience is going on. The issue is what is most useful for you. If you close your eyes and you feel shut in a little familiar comforting space, that's good for reassurance, but it might not give you much sense of change and expansion. If your eyes are very open, but you get hooked by checking out what's in front of you, that's also not very useful. So you yourself have to find the balance of being settled and there being movement. The movement is inseparable from the settledness. The mirror itself is not unsettled by the movement. The stability of the openness of the mirror is exactly what allows the movement of the reflections in the mirror, and they are the same. They are the same. When we say the same, it doesn't mean they're homogenized into one thing. It means we can't cut a line down the middle and put them apart. They are not apart, but neither are they merged into one thing. Only the practice will reveal this to you. You can study it again and again, there are many ideas about it, conceptual clarity, but then when you sit you get confused. Why? Because when you're reading or studying and you have your pen and you're sorting things out and you're making it clear, you are imposing structure and order and you're joining the points. This is a construction. 
the mind itself, as we looked yesterday, is unconstructed. So no matter how good you are at constructing your conceptual understanding, it won't take you to the unconstructed. So you have to let go of your beautiful, shining mental clarity and enter into the jungle of actual experience. And there are snakes and scorpions and ticks also. There are many, many little enemies there. But you are intrepid. Okay, so we do some sitting. <clears throat> Just relax in the out breath and be present with whatever is occurring. Okay. <clears throat> so this kind of practice generally we do for shorter periods of time, certainly if you're not used to it. And we do that because we are being with what is occurring. We're not doing to, being proactive, and we're not being done to, being impacted and then reactive. As soon as you slip off the open point of this moment, you become a subject in a field of objects and these pulsations will move you around and the mind gets disturbed. Settling is releasing ourselves from the dualistic entanglement and identification with either a position of self or identification of others. We just open. And it's in that openness that there is the possibility of being with whatever occurs. The ego can't do this. The ego is a positioning and it's always uh, either chasing after something or avoiding something. It's as we looked yesterday, the ego has a limited diet. It has a lot of allergies. It mm. cannot take everything. It's a fussy eater. Awareness eats everything and shits out everything. <laughs> through boot. So the more you relax mm. and you allow things to arise, it's easy if you don't say, this is self, this is not self. As soon as you say, this is me, liking and not liking will arise. Remember the three root poisons. The first is mental dullness, timuk, which is a kind of fogginess. It's a kind of, it's the way we often experience ourself, not as something very bright and clear, but it's just a kind of hazy sense of here I am, or somethingness. And on the basis of that, that somethingness, of that situatedness, which has location and duration, you then relate to what's occurring around you. So, releasing that into just openness, the ground nature of the mind is the Dharma Datu. Dharma, da, dharma means phenomena, and Datu means space. It's the space of all phenomena. So, if it's the space of all phenomena, then you can easily come and go. In the EU, you have free movement between countries. With Brexit, I am now denied free movement. Yeah, I'm an isolate. I'm a British self. <laughs> I did it my way, unfortunately. <laughs> So as soon as you have this isolation, you have particularization. Because you isolate, you're actually part of the whole, moving with the whole, but when you retract into my domain, the other, in its richness, is identified <clears throat> as a mass of factors some of which are attractive and some of which are not. And so you move towards some and away from others. And this is just the pulsation of dualistic identity in the world. You can't help it. There's no way to say, may all beings be happy, I love everyone. 
and then you look around and say, oh yeah, well. <laughs> because it is a visceral response, an aesthetic response, an energetic response. It's, it's just how it is. You can always see that when you go in the queue to get food. You look at other people's plates and you say, okay. <laughs> Some people, they look to me like a little sparrow. They put three seeds on the plate and they walk away happily. <laughs> other people have a mountain. <laughs> And that's how it is. If you have your particular energetic formation, you respond into the world in different ways. Existence brings particularization. The specificity of some things as good, the specificity of others as not so good. That's just the energetic play. Awareness is the only way to be free of that. Consciousness can't do it. You can't do it by willpower. So when somebody is elected, the new president, and they say, I am here to work for the benefit of everyone in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't believe it. That's what they have to say. They say, I am not prejudiced, but your party won the election. That's why you're the president. <laughs> that was before. Now I am for everyone. It's not possible. You can't be for everyone because even if you had absolute equanimity as the president, the people are conflicted. So you open to one group, the others are saying, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you helping them? Why are you helping them? Very difficult. In Britain at the moment, we've had train strikes Traditionally, the Labour Party, sort of quasi-socialist party, is in alignment with the trade unions. The trade unions have called the strike, but the leader of the Labour Party wants to be a centrist because you get more votes if you do that. So he doesn't come out and support the strikers because that would make him the enemy of business and international capitalism and finance and our pension plans. So he's trapped. I want to represent the country, <clears throat> but I have his identity. So you can see the truth of the Dharma in everyday life. Dharma is not separate from our existence. This, the structures of duality inform how everything moves for us. You cannot be a particular existent, a particular identity, and be open to everyone. It's impossible. It's always partisan. You're always with one party which puts you in conflict with another. So that's why we looked yesterday at these three aspects of the mind. The openness, the, the, the open face, its complexion, and then its expression. And the expression standing for all-pervading compassion is an expression which is not arising from a self-position, but it's the quality of connectivity in the moment. In the moment. And that's very important. How do we do that? <clears throat> By staying open. And if you've been around in Tibetan Buddhism a, a while, you know that uh, the guru attracts psychophants. And uh, that means they have an inner coterie, an inner group of close disciples. Close disciples turn towards the guru, smiling, anything for you, anything for you. And they turn around and say, fuck off, anything for you. Fuck off. Here are two mudras you need to be close to <laughs> Some of us have experience being on the outside knocking on the door. No, no. Rinpoche is busy. Busy what? Busy talking with me? <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem of position. This is why everyone says they love Pato Rinpoche, because Pato Rinpoche went out the door 
and wandered about, sleeping in the tents of the nomads, talking with everyone. Difficult if you become the named person with this uh, circle of iron guards around you. Remember the Vajra guards that uh, Chogyam Trumpa had, beating the shit out of people. Not a, not, not a good history. So, relax and open. Let's do another little sip. <coughs> Okay. So, one of the many uh, limitations which can arise for us in our practice is um, the sensations which seem to confirm the substantial reality of our body. I'm here. And this seems kind of irreducible. There's nothing I can do about it. Clearly, I've got the body. I am the body. This is me. And when you start from that position, you're, you're always in a, in a separation from the environment. So in the tradition, they're saying that you need to focus not on the uh, conclusion about the body, the concept of the body, but stay, open yourself to the phenomena of the body because we always have these two things in life. We have the map and the territory. Maps are offered through our parents, through our schooling, through newspapers, media, the books we read, conversations with other people. We are mapping and tracking a sense of how things are and what needs to happen. And then we have the actual territory. The territory is unpredictable. We don't know how life is going to be. The map is very clear. This is how we have to proceed. So, shall I look at the territory or look at the map? We look at the map. Like a child with a little soft toy, a little teddy bear, we hold on to the maps and then we don't have to worry about the world because the teddy bear is like my mama and when I've got my teddy bear, I'm okay. So we're electively blind. I know what I know. <coughs> of course, in the tradition, the graded paths, the lamering paths and so on, these are maps. You have a lot of maps, you can proceed. The ten bodhisattva bhumis, mm. the five ways, do your nundro, do this, maybe do and your yidam, hundred thousand repetitions of the mantra for each of the syllables in the mantra. And some of the mantras are very long. <laughs> Be careful when you choose the yidam. <laughs> <laughs> Years stretching ahead of you. I'm on my way. Let's get to train. That is a map. This will take me there. Where is there? It's over the hills, in the next valley. Next life, maybe. Oh, thank God for Deva Chen. Now. Mahamudra and Sukshen are concerned with the territory, not the map. Say, so careful of maps, because the map is a conceptualization, and if you rely on a conceptualization to make sense of the territory, you're saying that thoughts are clarity. They are the medium of clarity. In the Mahamudra and Sukshen, they say, no, being present is the medium of clarity, and the conceptualization, if you hold it in the clarity, you know, no problem. It's just like a wild flower in the field. But if the conceptualization is separated and becomes the judge, then you have a problem. Like we were you looking yesterday that Mahamudra means like the great seal, like the royal 
seal from the king. But a concept is also a seal, a sealant mm -hmm. that you put around something to keep it separate. So you need to be very careful. Mm -hmm. Stay with the territory. Mm -hmm. But then I don't know what I'm doing. For meditators, that is very, very good. If you know what you're doing, your concept has already gone ahead of you and prepared the territory. What does it say about the Dharmakaya? It's naked, fresh, raw. It's not prepared. It's just this, just this. So that's why uh, we need to release ourselves from our addiction to prepared food and have something fresh, <laughs> very healthy. So part of the way we do this is called uh, vipassana or in Tibetan klaktong, which means best looking or looking, uh, looking in a way that lets you see. Tongwa means to see, Klak means <laughs> supreme. Of that. So this is how to see, in fact, how to see through learning to see through looking. That would be a way to describe it. Because when we do the Vipassana practice, we are tracking looking, which lets us see. If you're looking for something, you're already predisposed, you're already tilted towards what you imagine will be the outcome. So this is a kind of looking which is kind of neutral. I just want to look and see. Look and see. The two are being linked. So really I want to see. <clears throat> so many of you have done this before. It's a very general practice. We'll do it in, again in the Theravadan style because it's the easiest way in. And we start, as we were doing yesterday, by bringing the attention to the sensation at the nostrils with the breath. When you have a, a sense of that, that you, you can uh, maintain at least some degree of attention, then you gently bring that focus of attention up to the top of your head. And then bring your attention down through the body, scanning down through the body, Anything happening? Anything happening? What, what is it that arises? Down to the tips of your feet, then back up again, slowly, slowly, then down again. What is impinging or presenting on the way down may not be doing that on the way back up. What is so important here is how to notice without contamination. You know, we have this idea in modern physics that the very act, the participative act of giving attention into an unfolding situation will alter the patterning of the situation. That is to say, what you get is what you get that you can't take yourself out of the experience. So this is what we have to be careful here. Because when we, when we register something, the tendency is very quickly to grasp it inside your way of making sense of it. So say, for example, you're going down and there's some little hot thing or stabbing thing, some little twinge in your shoulder. Just a moment of sensation. Oh, says, so, oh, now I am being impacted by this. Instead of it just being there, there's a kind of resonance which comes up. Oh, that's painful. And you go back down and you're coming back up. It's very difficult then not to be wondering, oh, is it still painful? And then, oh, maybe I need to do something about it. Then all kinds of thoughts come. What's wrong? Do, should I see a doctor? Could someone here give me a massage? You now have a reference point. So as you go down through the body, some areas go into the darkness, nothing happening, and someone getting a little bright light or something to attend to. So 
your map is starting to be drawn and the pool of that is very strong. So what we're always trying to do is notice and release, notice and release. Don't build up any conceptual identification. Don't link it to any other things that have been there before. It's just this, just this. And the more we do that, then we become, it becomes possible to experience the body as the body is. The body shows itself as a ceaseless energetic system with all kind of movements and registers coming out. So that's the purpose of Vipassana, that you see what can be seen. You attend to what is there without transforming it through mixing it with your conceptual knowledge or your body. Some people have lots of knowledge about the body and so on. Very, this huge database can easily be hooked into wondering, oh, is it this or is it that? For this kind of practice, in a sense, you want to not know very much because for this purpose, knowledge is not helpful. What is helpful is attention attention to this, whatever this is, could be pleasurable, could be painful, up and down, up and down, so that the actual dynamism of embodiment is there. So there's a little quote I would like to read to you. It comes from the famous Satipatthana Sutra. In the Buddha says, there is one thing that when cultivated and regularly practiced leads to deep spiritual intention, to peace, to mindfulness and clear comprehension, to vision and knowledge, to a happy life here and now, and to the culmination of wisdom and awakening. And what is that one thing? It is mindfulness centered on the body. Because the body it's very easy for us to assume that we know what the body is, that it is in fact a what. And the purpose of Vipassana is to see the how, not the what. And when you apply knowledge, you will always get a what. And when you apply simple attention, you start to see the how. Okay, so we start as yesterday our uh, line of attention down the nose, sense of sensation at the nostrils, and then when you are ready, bring that focus of attention to the top of your head, and then just slowly and gently up and down. <clears throat> Okay, so this is a practice you can do again and again. And uh, yesterday I was uh, inviting you to open yourself to the trees as they are and then turn and look at the building. And try to get an immediate felt sense of what we call nature and what we call culture. <clears throat> of course, nature is already planted. There's some artifice, some intention in pretty much the shape of all the nature in Europe. Nonetheless, you can see a radical difference between the chopped, the, the logs and the planks used for building the house and the trees in their connectivity with the earth and the sky. And I think if you get a, a real sense of that, it's very helpful for the meditation, because it's like a kind of litmus test, a way of seeing how you shift into the freshness of nature or the artifice of culture. So when you're scanning through the body, the sensations are, as it were, happenstance, a kind of randomness. It's just there, then gone. And there's no particular meaning in it, but it is as it is. Once you 
apprehend that sensation, once you start to make sense of it, this relation to it, me in relation to what's happening in my body, you start to formulate what's going on, why it might be going on, what could be done about it, and there you have culture. So you move from raw, fresh, immediacy, which in a sense is meaningless, and that's not a bad thing, that's the clarity, to the development of meaning through the application of concepts, memories, knowledge, and so on, and you formulate an interpretation. <coughs> and if you can see that, it's not that one is much better than the other, but if we're always cooking, if we're always formulating, we, we lack the raw, we lack the fresh. So again and again, when you find the tendency to interpret, to make sense of something, to enter into judgment, relax into the out-breath, it is what it is, it's fine, I'm not under attack, it might be a bit strange, it's just this, and then it's gone. Once you take hold of it, you pull the evanescent moment, like a bubble in a, in a mineral water, you pull it into a frame of reference, and that frame of reference is called the three times, past, present, and future. Now you're in linearity and progression, and you formulate it according to your interpretation. So this is a key thing. The immediate moment is not in the three times. It is now, it's just open presence. Formulated identity is always in the chain of the progression of time. There's duration, how long it lasts, and there's location, where it is in relation to other phenomena. And then you nail down your patterning of the world. So we have a great chance here to, to just look at the wildness, even in the little bit of garden around here. So many things growing, the brambles are coming up. There's one on the veranda and it's leaning out and saying, give me life. <laughs> scratch you. <laughs> like some wild monster in a science fiction movie. <laughs> and it's so amazing to see that. Why is it doing that? Because, because, it just is. So that's uh, amazing for us to see. We don't need to offer our thoughts to the world. The world is offering us the chance to be present with it and in that to have a holiday from the endless task of interpretation which is the burden of samsara. Um, I, over the winter with a couple of friends, we made a couple of books, I brought just one copy of each, and I'll leave them on the table here to have a look if you would like. One is a book for children, uh, and it has uh, nice drawings inside, and a little uh, Dharma message all the way through, with nice Wellington books, for boots for every situation, <laughs> children playing. It's a, it's a sweet little book, but the message is, uh, I think, quite interesting. <laughs> the other is a retelling of a story uh, which comes from a biography of Padmasambhava and it's about the, the first manifestation of the Herukas as a way of dealing with uh, an energy committed to the destruction of all opposition. So it's a me first. It's really the energy of domination and control. And so the, the story is quite simple, but it has many pictures. So you can have a look at that. Because the, I think the, this is a time where we all have creativity. We all have possibilities of taking the Dharma and bringing it into the world. The number of Buddhists in the world is not many. The number of people who are caught up in self-destructive activities is much more. There are probably more heroin addicts in Germany than Buddhists. 
you know, I want to throw my life into the wind. Fuck it, I don't care. That's very attractive, very easy. Dharma is more difficult. So, without uh, thinning the Dharma, we need to find a way to express Dharma which can speak into the modern situation. And hopefully that will happen more through music, uh, through dance, through drama, through art productions, through books, through storytelling. There are many pathways and everybody has some potential to be part of that. Just, you know, when you're talking with friends, if they're not in Dharma, what would be the simplest, easiest, non-evangelistic, non-missionary way of just bringing a little hint of another perspective. And I think that delicacy allows you to get a, a very close angle to their existence. And because what we want to be saying is, it's not far away. You don't have to renounce the world. You don't have to turn your life upside down. It's just a little tilt. And, oh, something new arises. So that would be the encouragement, and the books are there to have a look if you like, and we have a break now. So, uh, as we uh, move towards looking at the, the Dohas, uh, I'll just say a little bit about the background of that and then look at this short text of Naropa. Clearly, being a yogi is quite lonely, especially in India in the old days. Uh, it, many are outcasts, they're like beggars. Uh, and so they would like every now and then to meet together. And that meeting was called uh, Gana Chakra. Gana as uh, the idea of collecting things together, like we have in the Hindu tradition, Ganesh or Ganapati, who is the, the lord of uh, accumulations of substances, of enjoyment, who brings blessing to food. And uh, the chakra is the wheel or the assembly in which things are shared. Uh, people meet together, do some practice together, and share the, the tzok, the assembled food, and so on. And in those times, there was also the custom of showing what had awakened for you, a kind of introducing yourself through a song about uh, your Dharma experience and what had come alive for you. So it wasn't uh, it wasn't like a, doing a, a first level university exam where you have to show that you know something, that you are in harmony with the syllabus. It'd be more like doing a traditional doctorate in which the thesis has to manifest some unique understanding, that you bring something new. So the, these Doha songs are condensed expressions of a spontaneous integrity of how the Dharma is alive in someone. It's not a a system based on accumulated knowledge. Because if the Dharma is not in your fingertips, if it's not in your skin and in your heart, or as the Tibetans would say, in your uh, flesh and in your blood and in the marrow of your bones, then how is it going to function for you? It's something you remember and then you forget, and you remember and you forget. But if, if it is your way of being in the world, then your world is Dharma. <clears throat> so the task is always encountering, internalizing, and then metabolizing. And it's that process of metabolizing which is often very difficult. Because 
sometimes dharma is like a heart transplant. It is something foreign which comes into you. You already have a kind of mental body which has the structure of your family and your culture. And then you put dharma into that and there is a resistance. The body wants to reject it, saying, uh-uh. And so you either you forget dharma, which of course many people do. They come to dharma centers for a while, then they vanish. Or you live with a kind of disjunction inside yourself and flip from one to the other. So with heart transplants, now they've developed many amazing medications which can lower the body's resistance and in a sense deceive itself into not recognizing this is foreign. So the foreign becomes something which can be integrated. For us to do that, we have to give ourselves to the Dharma. If it's effortful, then the effort will pervade all the ways in which we relate to what is going on. So how do we find the possibility of um, non-resistance? This is an interesting thing. For example, if you were working in improvisation, improvisation is not me improvising something unless you were doing it on your own. But if you were doing it with other people, firstly, you give yourself to the group. Then the energy, the systemic energy of the group improvises through you so that you are not the agent of the improvisation, but you are the, the medium or the conduit, the pathway through which the uh, improvisation travels. Mm. Because if you remain the one who is doing it, then there's always a gap between you and the other people. And that can lead to rivalries, conflicts, uh, non-blocking uh, of someone else's moves and so on. Because if it's your bit, and it's yours ring fenced, then why, why are you interfering with what I'm doing? So it, in a sense, it has to be the ground improvises. And this is what we do in the meditation. We open to the ground and we let the ground's energy rise through us so that we are pathways of the energy of the ground. This has the advantage that the ground has a lot more resources than the ego. The ground has limitless energy. The ground is connected in all directions. The ego self is limited in capacity, gets tired, gets into repetitions, and becomes exhausted. So it's about disidentifying without re-identifying. Because identity means I identify myself with this or as this. I have an identity, but in order to have something, you're not it. I have a watch, but as far as I know, I am not a watch. I have a passport, but I am not my passport. If I come to the land in the airport in Frankfurt, they don't say, oh, pretty boy, you go through. <laughs> they say, sad, tired old man, where's your passport? And if you don't have your passport, they say, oh, go in that room. So identity is the abstract signifier of a social existence. We don't want to be focused on identity in meditation. The factors of the five skandhas, your habits, your personality traits, your karmic movements, these are all feeding the patterns of an individual identity. So we want to release that again and again. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I am. And yet I am. How I am depends, depends on circumstances. 
the word being is a little bit problematic in English because it can be taken to mean uh, pointing to something which exists. This is. I am. The verb to be can seem to be uh, referring to something which is. But being itself, or simply being, or the openness of being, is the presencing which is undeniable without it being something in particular. Or rather, being is always something in particular for that moment. The particularization of our being is immediate, direct, and ephemeral. It doesn't last. So each of us, in your posture, how you're breathing, the kind of attention you've got, whether, you, whether your mind's wandering or not, that is the manifestation of how you are for this moment. If we wrote it down, it would not in any way indicate who you are. You couldn't put that uh, description on a passport and get through the, the border. They would say, ah, but you're not like that now. I was like that. I was like that. I was like that. What are you? I'm this. For a while. So the openness of being is always reliable. The Dharmakaya never changes. The mind itself, the open ground of how you manifest, that never changes. But the aspect of our being here-ness, which is manifesting, is always changing, and it's changing with circumstances. So if we have a if we have a sense of that. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and we see that what I take to be who I am, my familiar sense of self, is a construct which I am maintaining by editing. That is to say, I abstract aspects of my experience, take, I take them out of their context, and I construct with them an image, an imago of who I am. And then I can refer to that image, which is nowhere, because it's just a conceptual abstraction. I can relate to that as my continuing identity. And this is what's meant by the self. We have qualities of the self, but we also just have the selfness of the self. And the self is an idea. The self is never actual as an immediate phenomenal experience. The self is a conclusion and a prediction. It's a conclusion because it's a, a, a condensation of moments. For example, we have these white wispy clouds in the sky just now. If they gather together, if it's a very hot afternoon, they gather together and they form and the cloud gets darker and darker and then maybe there's a storm and some rain. The rain is present in the cloud, but in its dispersed form as a white cloud, we only see fluffy. But when fluffy goes dark and you get the raindrops, then it's something more impactful. So it's the same with us. The actual basis of what we take to be our identity is transient fluffy cloud. It has no substance. But when it becomes gathered and compacted, that force field seems to take on a facticity. Uh, uh, it is a fact. A fact, as we generally use the term, is a truth which is continuingly available through time. You can, repair, you can refer back to the fact, but you can't really refer back to the experience because the experience has vanished, but the abstraction of the conclusion or the fact or the summation seems to take on this life through time. So the practice that we're doing is a practice of non-construction. 
it can have elements of destruction in it, but usually it's a practice of deconstruction. <clears throat> deconstruction is simply to release the subject-object conjugation, the joining or meeting of subject and object, which is the engine driving construction, building up an image or a picture of yourself. The reason it's a dynamic activity is, just as we've looked already now quite a few times, the actual is always vanishing. You can't build on top of the waves because the waves are vanishing. In the, well, not in the Arctic anymore, but in the Antarctic, the waves freeze and then you have ice. And ice seems to be more reliable. There's a kind of prediction you can do things. They drill through these huge icebergs and then they can work out how long it's been there according to the substances from the air and so on. The waves are not like that. So the freezing of the water is still water. The freezing of the thought it's still a thought. There's nothing graspable there. But the, the freezing, the conceptualization, the gathering into this conclusion, the ego seal, the existence seal, there is inherent existence in this. I exist. The, my family exists. My car exists. My job exists. Germany exists. We are this. That sealing into substance is a conceptual activity. It actually doesn't create anything. Because Germany is a dynamic form. At the moment, it seems reasonably quiescent, but not so long ago, the Berlin Wall came down. East Germany was united with West Germany. Not so long before that, Germany was reduced to rubble. Not long before that, Germany was expanding out to take over the world. Not long before that, Germany had an economic collapse. Not long before that was the First World War. I thought, back and back and back. What is Germany? We think, oh, on the map, this is the map of Germany. You learn that in school. By the time you grow up, then maybe you have a different map. This is the situation of Ukraine now. What looked like an independent, autonomous unit is now being grasped and taken hold of. That's an activity, physical activity, dangerous, warlike activity arising from ideas. I do not accept the independence of Ukraine. That's Putin's position and on the basis of that there's the felt sense seemingly for him and his close associates and it, with it comes this entitlement to enact the belief. It's ours. And so we take it. And we see all over the world this land grab. The British did it in Australia, killing off so many of the Aborigines. We did it in the American colonies, starting to kill off the native Indian population. And that was then taken on by the uh, white Americans when they got their independence. They, let go of England, but they kept the toxicity of the English colonial system and pretty well annihilated uh, the native cultures because it's mine. And it's so interesting. What they say is, we have lawyers, we write documents, we have documents that state this land belongs to us. What? documents do you have? <laughs> no paper? Huh. It's ours. That's how it's done. Very, very easy. Because it's a legal idea and the law deals in abstractions, in conventional descriptions which only work as, every, as long as everybody agrees they are true. So in Britain, we had a law that said homosexuality is illegal. And that functioned and people were put in prison and they were shamed and humiliated and many gay people killed themselves because the law said, you are not a proper person. 
then the law changes. It's as if, well, suddenly they are proper people. It was just the legalistic optician who was altering the lenses. Nothing really changed, but the definition changed. So this is what it means in Buddhism when we think about conventional truth. It is not inherently true, intrinsically true. It's not true in and of itself, but it becomes functionally true if people agree to act as if it is true. For example, in Britain, domestic violence, a man beating his partner, was not a formal offence until quite recently. If it's your wife, you can beat her. Why not? Why else would you get married? Come on. <laughs> Beating and fucking and eating her food. What else do I want? Eh? <laughs> then the law changes. Suddenly, it's a crime. You shouldn't do that. So you, whether you should or you shouldn't is not grounded in some universal system of morality. It's generated from the agreements that people will have. And it was only by women protesting again and again and again that finally this idea that men should not harm women starts to emerge into a generalized consciousness and, and becomes a bit operative, but still with many, many dangerous places. So this is what a convention is. It seems to be true. It seems to be guaranteeing something, but it has to be imposed. And that depends on the police. And I remember when I was working in the hospital system, the uh, psychiatrist who was the head of a unit that I was part of at that time, he described that when he was a GP, a general doctor in a poor part of London, uh, he had a patient who, a woman who came into the surgery and she was really battered and she had a broken arm. And she started to treat her, asking what happened. And she said, well, my, my husband didn't come home and he hadn't brought his wages home, so I had to go to the pub to find him. And I went into the pub and said, come on, Johnny, you've got to come home. We haven't got food on the table for the kids. And he came out and he was really angry. You shame me in public, you bitch. And he started beating her up. And he got her on the ground and he was kicking her. And then what happened? She, she, she said, oh, a policeman came up. And he said to the man, take your business home. Don't do it in the street. That's 1940s in London. Because it's domestic. It's your wife. We don't interfere. So that's it. It's so important to see these things, because if your protection in the world is dependent on the law, you're pretty well unprotected, mm -hmm. you know? And this is why we try to get out of samsara, because it's not a safe place. The, the cavalry is not coming. Nobody's come up, going to come over the hill and rescue you. Which means don't take refuge in concepts. Mm -hmm. Try to find unborn awareness, mm -hmm. which is the basis through which these various constructs are moving. So in the introduction to the Sweet Simplicity book, I mentioned these uh, six words of Naropa, which are very famous brief formulation of uh, how to bring yourself towards the state of Mahamudra. It's uh, written in a slightly uh, prohibitive language, like saying, don't do this. But it's more like, uh, be aware of how you get caught in this. Be aware that you have got a habit of doing this. So wagging a finger at someone saying, don't do it, that's not going to help very much. But it's more like saying, it's pretty dangerous if you do this. Be careful. First, put the light on, see what you're up to, Observe how you relate to people. Mm. You put yourself in prison. You get carried away. You fall in love with ideas and act them out. Any benefit from this? Any real development in your life? 
be careful. So the first one he says is uh, in me know, in, which means something like to think, to ponder, to imagine. Uh, and in this case, particularly, don't recall means we have the three times, past, present, and future, and we have now. If you stay with now, then it is clear that actuality is only ever now. Just this. The past is conceptual. Memory is unreliable. Memory is a creative act, as so much research has shown recently. We reformulate our stories of events according to circumstances, the time that's gone by, and so on. So when you recall something and you think about it, even if you're thinking of something positive, maybe you're recalling the kindness of some school teacher in your life who helped you or your parents, or you recall having a dog that you really loved, whatever it would be, what happens when you recall? Something comes to mind, seemingly present for you, where is it? It's now. It's always now. You can't go into the past. The past can't come to you. This is a kind of simulacrum, some kind of replication of the past, which you are taking to be the present, but it is in its remembrance already becoming double past. Mm -hmm. You recall the past momentarily, and now you remember that you recalled the past, and you can do an infinite, infinite regression of that. You cannot catch the past. What you are doing is infecting your openness in the moment with this ghostly clouding, this encumbrance of what you take to have been the past. You are pre-positioning, you have a disposition, you are turning in a particular orientation towards what is there. That is to say, you are interpreting. So when you recall the past, you're feeding interpretation about the present. So that's what this meaning If you want to be here and now, you don't need mental activity to do that. Mental activity takes you to the past or the future, not to here. Here is already here. You don't have to make it, you can't buy it, you can't sell it, you can't lose it, it's just here. But if you fill here with there, then it will be as if you are there, but you will not be there. So, if you, in your generosity, invite me to watch the video you made of your last holiday on the Mediterranean, and I have to sit for an hour watching pictures of you sitting with a little glass of Prosecco in the sunshine. <laughs> what, what are you feeding me? <laughs> Nothing at all. That's it. It's mean, it seems meaningful for the person who was there because they're getting an emotional resonance and we're getting boredom, envy, <laughs> <laughs> incomprehension. So very often when we tell stories, that's what we're doing. The life of a therapist is very similar to someone watching holiday movies endlessly. <laughs> My mum was never kind to me. <laughs> you want me to believe her? Uh, not possible for me to believe her. From, from the day you were born until you could walk and go to the toilet by yourself, your mother never wiped your ass even once? Really? You were so caked in shit in layers of it? Yeah, really? Okay. You're telling me a story. What, what, what's the purpose of this story? 
I should feel pity for you and sadness that your life is hard. As therapists, you're very, very limited in what you can do. Because you're professional and you're inside a code of conduct. One of my friends in Holland, a woman with a couple of kids at that time, she was bringing up on her own, it was hard, she had health problems. She used to go along from her village along the canal and there was an isolated house which a woman was living, kind of wise old woman, <clears throat> uh, had many different experiences in her life and she used to go and talk to this woman. One day she's there and she's again telling how hard it is, how difficult it is. The woman said, ah, I can help you. She said, come outside with me. She said, give me your hand, let me see. She grabbed her finger and she rubbed it up and down on the bricks on the wall until the blood came out. She said, now, do you feel something? She said, yeah, pain, ah, that is pain. What you tell me is not pain. <laughs> <laughs> that was a big waking up for her, no? <laughs> but professionally you're not allowed to. <laughs> but you can imagine some of these yogis in India exactly doing that, slapping someone, saying, for fuck's sake, no more stories. You might want to believe your stories, but I don't believe your stories, and I'm not going to be wrapped inside your conceptual elaboration. Because the whole of life can go on in amateur dramatics. Just on and on. And on. So it's very powerful. So that's in a sense saying, don't recall is like that. Don't keep fabricating some story of yourself, which seems then to take on some explanatory power. The reason my life hasn't been fulfilled, the, the reason my adult relationships don't work out is because of this and this and this. I join the dots and I make this pattern. Buddhism doesn't say that. Buddhism says, due to your actions in a previous life, you have the ripening of your karma now. It is in your hand, not your mom, not your dad, not your first boyfriend, not your friends at school. It's in your hand. This is the result of your action. So look at your mind and see why do you engage in the actions which bring about these difficult situations. That's incredibly empowering, if you accept it, if you work into that. Because then you don't need to recall anything. You know, like the, the Buddha said, if you want to know about your previous lives, look at your body now. If you want to know about your body in future lives, look at your activity now. You don't need to go into all the detail and try to remember that you were a frog or a dog, you can just see, wow, it's like this, it's like this. This is how it's manifesting for me. And it's not guaranteed by some essence of me. It is, there is a, a fueling, which is the tendencies and energy that were invested in a particular moment of enactment and that formation and life energy and commitment that now rises as the source and the fueling of how your life is emerging at the moment. So how your life is emerging is not some eternal truth about yourself, but is the result of a pattern. And when the energy of that is exhausted, you will end. Like they say, if you've done a lot of good actions, you, when you die, you can go up into the God realms. If you go born in the sensor, sensuous God realms, you have a lot of luxury, pleasure through the body, that sweet music, everything comes very easily without effort. But it's like a taxi, the meter is running. You've only got so much money for the taxi. And when your money is out, the taxi driver stops and says, now you walk, <laughs> and then you die. But I belong here. Uh-uh. It's just a cab ride. 
is not your home. You don't have a home. You have transient dwellings which you take to be yours. So this instruction of not recalling is very, very profound and important to really see the past is a stream of energy in the Tibetan they call it Rangyu or in Sanskrit Santana, which means like the flow of yourself. This like if you if you go in a little river and you on the bridge and you look down, you see the water and it kind of bubbles up as it goes over the stones. And that's our life, with it. We're kind of moving with circumstances. There's a kind of continuity to the river, and yet it's always changing. Stay in the moment. Then you see thisness. So he's saying, don't recall. Then secondly, masam or masampa. Don't imagine. Sampas are mental uh, capacity to imagine situations. That is to say, to imagine something different from what is here. So that we can distract ourselves from the unique formation of this moment. You can imagine a better future for the world. You can imagine things that governments could do to improve it. You could imagine peace. You could imagine all sorts of sweet things. Why wouldn't you imagine these things? Because imagining is the formation of new patterns of mental energy. projected into an illusory future, an unborn future, a future which may never arrive. Mahamudra is concerned with being here, being right here, not being anywhere else. When you are imagining something, you have the as if, and the as if is being installed in the place of the as is. This is not good. So this is like a bird that comes and lays its egg in another bird's nest. <clears throat> As if. This happens when you don't have clear ownership of the nest. The nest is how it is. How it is. If you simply have an idea of how it is and you think that the problem with how it is is proven by your idea, then you have to act according to this new idea of how it would be better. So, again, back to my heartburn topic. Britain <laughs> was part of Europe. Britain had many problems. What was the cause of these problems? Europe. 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 <laughs> if we get rid of Europe, we will have no problems. And so many people believe that. This kind of stupidity is so readily available. It will be quick and easy and magical, and then you'll be free. People sign up for this. And then you have the consequence. Because it's not what you imagined. It's a new actual which, given the complexity of the field, given all the many factors that are operating, is always unimagined. We didn't see it coming. Why? Because the politicians were proposing a fantasy. So, imagining can be useful sometimes. The whole of Tantra is about imagination. There, the power of imagination is being utilized to thin and make more transparent what you are already imagining. You imagine you exist, you imagine you are this specific person, you are imagining that you know who you are and what you like, so you start from this, this is me. And then you do the practice and you become Chenrezig. How do you become Chenrezi? By imagining your Chenrezi, in saying the mantra again and again, in getting the initiation, and getting more teachings, 
and you're massaging chin raisiness into yourself. And through that, you're softening the sense that you are who you've traditionally taken yourself to be. You merge with the Yidam, if it's your meditation deity. I am Chen Reisi. This is who I truly am, but I still show this conventional identity because that's what people expect of me. But the truth of me is my inner identity as the deity. Now, that imagining the devotion and the power and beauty of it and having your shrine and lighting your candles or butter lamps, burning the incense and the sweet sounds of the chant, all of that is helping to create the sense this is the mind at work. My mind is Chenrezi or my mind is John. If my mind is John, John seems real to me. If my mind fully opens to Chenrezi, then I'm Chenrezi. Which one will I choose? And then you see the disadvantages of being John. You're going to die. You don't know where you're going. You don't know who you are. Well, you become Chinrezi, you go to the potala, there's <laughs> music in the air, dancing girls. Oh. And when you look in the tongue, you think, wow, these dancing girls are not very much on the top. <laughs> wow, I could be there. <laughs> John is now Chinrezi. <laughs> it's the imagination. And the function of that is not to say, oh, it's only imagined, it's some kind of pretense. It's not like that. It's to realize samsara is imagined, nirvana is imagined. If you go right back to this uh, aspiration of Samantabhadra, the unborn, ungraspable, unimaginable ground gives rise to these two magical formations, awareness and unawareness. Following the path of unawareness, you imagine I exist, this exists, I'm not like you, I don't like you, I do like you, hopes and fears, karmic activity, and you're born again and again in the samsara. This is all imagined. It doesn't mean you don't get a quack. It is mental, but in the belief in the mental, it has impact. Impact. Imagination doesn't mean there's no impact. It is formational and your formation is in a field of other imagined formations and they grind together or they collaborate. Awareness is also imagined. Uh, Siya Lama said to me many, many times, you can read all these Dharma books. There is only one thing you need to know. In the center of the universe, there is one letter R, and that's all. <laughs> Just emptiness. So you need that prasangika moment, that kind of hard line, only emptiness, only emptiness, because it has a function. And then you need this uh, yogachara, samsamba view of the mind creates, the creativity of the mind it manifests as all these forms, and then you see that as well. And these are not opposites. Emptiness and creativity have to be aligned so that you don't go into a permanent view of what is imagined, and you don't go into a nihilist view of the fact of emptiness. So, not imagining means actually to know that you are imagining. Because then you bring clarity to the imagining, and you don't fall into it. For example, if you go, I don't know if gambling is a big thing in Germany, but it's pretty big among poor people in England, and you can go into these uh, places where they sell bets on football teams and horses and so on. I'm sure I'm on a winner today. I imagine I might win a lot of money. And I don't want to imagine that I could lose my money. So selective imagining is necessary for gambling. <laughs> if you imagined you were going to lose everything, you wouldn't go in the door. So there you see, people waste their money 
because they don't have a panoramic imagining. I look at the world. There are drinkers sitting in the street with urine stains on their trousers. They're just getting out of it and they don't care anymore. They're just pissed. Oh, that can happen to people. They give up hope. They abandon themselves. Their mothers could never have imagined their child would do that. When they were young, they never imagined they'd be pissing themselves in the street. But it comes about by little micro moves of imagining. Imagining this will be worthwhile. Imagining that if my mate, he's thinking, you know, we're going to rob something and we'll get the money and then you get arrested and then you're in prison for a couple of years. You have a horrible time in prison. You come out, you can't get a job. It's all on the basis of imagining. So this is a chance for us to look at our own lives. What is it that I imagine? And even if I have a beautiful imagining, like, oh, we're going to help the development of this Dharma center here. That's a very nice imagining. Hmm. The problem with this place is, as soon as I imagine how it could develop, Onto my poor, tired shoulders comes the burden <laughs> of doing the actual development. <laughs> Imagining is very quick, <laughs> but actual work, that's difficult. Many problems arise as soon as you try to fulfill your imagination. Mm -hmm. So we say, uh, look in your purse before you purchase. Count your costs, count your resources. It's a beautiful idea. Do we have the money? Do we have the energy? Do we have the collaborators? Do we have volunteers? Because otherwise, a few people are going to get incredibly stressed and then start fighting between each other and so on. So if we're going to maintain a harmonious synergy that allows us to be a good ethical functioning Sangha, we need to be clear what's involved and, and resource ourselves as well. We have to imagine difficulties as well as good outcomes. So, when we review life in the six uh, realms, that's what we're doing. We're looking at possible negative outcomes. And then we think, okay, how shall I apply the resources of this life which I have now, my body, speech and mind, my reasonable health at the moment, the functioning of my organs, how will I imagine the fulfillment of that, given that I'm going to die, I have worldly commitments, I don't have much free time, how much dharma will I manage to do before I die? What is the essence of the dharma that I need to do? So if you look at the teachings on the six bardos, when you die and you go into Dharma, the uh, bardo, the intermediate stage of the dharmata, of the, the actuality of everything. If you've been there in your practice, if you know that I am nothing in nothing and here I am, then it's okay. Mm -hmm. But if you've had the blinkers on and you've been trying to achieve things and you think I'm a good person, because I'm a good person, mm -hmm. this is who I am, I can't open to nothing. Because now nothing seems like oblivion and wipeout and non-existence. I am existent. I don't want non-existence, but now it's non-existent. Uh, and that's why in the description, the light goes on, light goes off, like some crazy disco with a funny strobe light. <laughs> and then suddenly there's the peaceful gods. And your chance of liberation in the Dharmakaya is gone. Because I'm someone. I exist. Come on. I'm here. And here is me. So this is why we do the practice again and again. We're not here as me, we're here. And the meing is a process moving through the moment of being here. Yeah? So that's uh, this uh, second point of being careful with imagining. If you know that everything is imagining, then it is form and emptiness. It's appearance and emptiness. Because it appears, you have to work with these circumstances. Because it's empty, don't put too much value in it. Remember when the Chinese came into Tibet, 
they were very sweet at first and so on, and then gradually the noose started to tighten. And the fortunate ones managed to get over the, the valleys and into Tibet, in, into India. And then a new Tibet was born, you know, especially when the Cultural Revolution came. Absolute destruction. How could you melt down a statue of the Buddha? How could you do that? This is the Buddha. Now, for the, for the higher lamas, it was easier because they know this is a piece of metal. We did the puja, we did the rabni, we did the consecration, we made a piece of metal a Buddha. If you can make metal into Buddha, you can make Buddha into metal. It's not so difficult. You have that everywhere where the Christians' membership of churches is getting smaller. They de-sacralize uh, churches, de-consecrate churches. The priest comes in, they do a special ritual, they gather Jesus and mm. the Holy Ghost and God in a little packet and they put it in their pocket <laughs> and go out the door. It's over to you. No, no God left in this house. Because you made it holy. You make it unholy. That's what the ministers know. But the poor people, they come in, oh, it's holy. Self-existing holy, always been holy. This new church is always holy from the very beginning, which was last week, but it's forever. <laughs> so that's an un, in a sense, as a devotee, that imagination is wonderful because it's an unimpeded opening, but to a mental construct. So if you realize, when I imagine this, I feel like this, that's great. That's like doing five rhythm dancing. Now we're going to do staccato. <laughs> For a while, according to the beat, according to the rhythm. Then we do something else. Then we do something else. You're always imagining yourself to be someone. <clears throat> so this is a key thing. Out of nothing, imagining something which is still nothing, even as it's imagined. If you keep that wave moving in your mind, then you're free to generate the patterns necessary for connectivity with different people, which is an imaginal act. Empathic attunement is a, an imaginal act. You try to get a felt sense of how the person is, and you bring yourself into some harmonizing with that. And then you don't do that. Because if you do that as a therapist with your own children, they will hate you. <laughs> they say, get out of my head. Get out of my bedroom. Get out of my head. Go away. But I understand. Fuck off. <laughs> it's completely like that. No. So you have to imagine whether the other person wants your close imagining or not. And if they don't want it, don't imagine it. Yeah, something's happening. I don't know what it is. They'll tell me sooner or later, maybe. So the third point is misem, <coughs> which means don't think. Let go of what is happening now. What is it? I don't know. We think about it. We invent the airplane moving in the sky. It's a sound. If you leave it as sound, you can feel vibration. You can feel your, what your body does with this vibration. The airplane showing you the ungraspability of sound. You grasp at the sound with the idea it's an aeroplane, and then you miss the gift of the sound. Sound says, can't catch me, can't catch me. Ah, it's an aeroplane. What did you catch? Yourself. You locked yourself in a conceptual box 
in the blessing of the airplane or the blessing of the bird cry or the car on the road or hearing someone talking in the distance is something's moving and gone. Sound arises from silence and goes into silence. If you follow the sound, it takes you into silence, which has no limit, which is openness, which is space. So you see, if you think about the moment, you fill it with yourself, and then it's never fresh for you. you know, you'll be visiting these points again and again, because actually you can write Mahamudra on the back of an envelope. It's not very complicated, it's very simple. What is complicated is the many, many ways in which we distract ourselves from how it is. Because we identify with mental activity <coughs> as a vehicle of truth, rather than mental activity as a flow of creativity, of imagining as potential, as possibility. So in any situation, do you need to know what it is? What is this for? We are habituated to doing it. What does it mean? What is its purpose? How can I use it? Do I need to act? If you're sitting on a meditation cushion, none of these questions are relevant. It's just this, and then it's gone. Don't process it. Don't add ingredients. Imagine if you go for lunch in half an hour and the cook comes out and says, I don't know what happened, we didn't get any fresh deliveries. But I have these old tins here and it says on the label E342, E528. Oh, and uh, a lot of chili powder, cheap version. Would you like some? <laughs> processed? It's processed so you know that there's no danger of anything that can't be boiled out or steamed out or fried <coughs> out. This is pure, purely processed. Nowadays people say, ah, oh, I don't want that. So why are you running a processing factory in your mind? Do you want to feed yourself McDonald's till you die? The McDonald's of the mind. <laughs> Kentucky Fried Fantasy. <laughs> That's what we're doing. We're processing the world. So the raw, the fresh, the immediate doesn't require the spices. It's not that you shouldn't do them or that these additions are necessarily contaminants because if you know that what you add is empty and what you're adding it to is empty, then you have a an interplay of illusion, which may be very useful. It's when you think that the world needs my interpretation. Well, the world does need your interpretation for you to function culturally as an identified human being, but that's not the truth of you. You can have your Dharma awareness and do the human thing. You've been doing the human thing a long time, so you do it on automatic pilot, but you put the light on and you see, oh, this is performative. This is the theater of samsara in which I'm maintaining the role that was assigned to me in birth as a man or a woman or as an educated person or as a day laborer, however it was. So don't think too much. Then you won't know what is happening. But happening will be going on. Happening is happening. We hear. What is happening? Back to me. I decide what is happening. Then I have thoughts about what's happening. And the problem with thoughts, like for many people, chocolate, one piece is never enough. <laughs> so you have a thought, and the thought is lonely, orphaned. Give it a friend. So you have another thought. So when I hear the motorbikes, I remember being in Totmos in the Black Forest, and there were always, especially on the Sunday, these motorbikes coming down the hill. 
and always I had some anxiety. These crazy people are going to die. It goes to hell of a speed around windy bends. They're going to die. And then I remember the reason I have that feeling is when I was 14, I had been out walking with a friend and we camped out in the country. And he and I were very wet and cold the next morning. We were trying to hitchhike to get back down this loch. And a truck stopped, and we were very glad. He said, I'll jump on the back. We jumped on the back of the truck. <sighs> and then started to move. And then we found that actually there's nothing to hold on on the back. It didn't have any size. It was just a flat truck. Right. And the back of the cab was just straight metal. So it's going round the bends. <laughs> and this fear coming. <laughs> banging on it. And he's just having a good time, right? <laughs> By the time we go off, I just uh, piss myself. Uh, so when I hear the motorbike, so there's a chain of thoughts, <laughs> which we have. We all have these patterns of signifiers, of resonances. And it brings an intensity. So this, which was already vanishing, is now being wrapped in this coating of associations. So when you observe how this happens in your mind, you see, oh, the density of life, so many fears and hesitations and uncertainties are arising from these patterns which I am maintaining. Linking. Linking is thinking. Thinking is linking. You cannot think without constellating. Remember this fourth skanda, duche, gathering together, bringing about patterns. So, then we have uh, number four, Mitru, which means don't uh, analyze, don't examine, don't try to figure out what's going on. If you get a blood test and you get sent to the laboratory, you have to hope that the things that they're using for processing your blood are clean. Laboratories need a lot of cleaning because if they contaminate your sample with someone else's sample or with some dirty thing, then it's not a very good outcome. So now we have to remember the three port faults. Listening like an upturned pot, listening like a pot with a hole in it, and listening like a pot with old food in it, in which our old neurotic conceptualization gets mixed in with the Dharma. So this is the problem of analysis. Can we actually do a clean, pure analysis? Can we think? Have we been trained in logic? In Tibetan monasteries, the young monks spend years and years doing logic. They do these debates that we've all seen images of. They study very difficult texts which are designed to sharpen the mind so that you're a little bit suspicious. Looks true, but is it? Hmm. Okay, check it out. And so if you have that fine honed intellectual or intelligent capacity to analyze, you're not taken in so easily. You don't simply believe, you find the evidence and then you believe. Three basic forms of evidence, direct perception, valid inference, you see smoke, oh, there must be fire. And the third one, which is a kind of little special kiss to hierarchy, the words of the wise. <laughs> if the Lama said it, it must be true. Which is a very interesting message, which says, don't analyze what the Lama says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can think about the power dynamics of that for yourself. <laughs> Better to trust your own mind. See, Rama always said, don't trust anyone. And he said, as many of you have heard me say about himself, he was liar number one, cheater number one. He said, don't trust me. Huh? 
I'm old, I'm going to die. Trust yourself. You don't know how to trust yourself? Practice the Dharma. Trusting other people. It's very important. So, don't analyze unless you are clear that you have a clean laboratory. If you look down the microscope, maybe clean the lens first. Oh, that sandwich I ate had too much butter. Now it's gone on the lens. No wonder it's foggy. You don't see clearly. You don't see. You think you see. You imagine. You believe that what you imagine is what you really see. But you only see it because it's obscured. We're in samsara. Obscuration. So this is very important. If you have clarity, you don't need to analyze. If you don't have clarity, your analysis is probably not going to be very clear. <clears throat> so, then number five, uh, mi gong. Gomba can mean meditating, but it usually it means a kind of constructive meditation, like developing a mandala or visualizing uh, according to Bodhisattva Samantabhadra, the sky is full of Buddhas. Each Buddha is surrounded by Bodhisattvas. Each of these, as many as there are grains of sand in the river Ganges, so you get this huge development. That's Gomba, to make the mind produce particular formations. So it's saying, don't do that. That is artificial. The mind, like some of you know this uh, prayer to Padmasambhava, Masam, Macha Tetra Lama Chukiku. Macha means unartificial, uncontrived. Tetra, free of all mental elaborations. This is the Dharmakaya. Dharmakaya is uncontrived not produced. So if you want to find your own dharmakaya nature, your mind as it is from the very beginning, don't make things happen. Don't be artificial. So when you're sitting in the practice and you're hot and you're tired and you're sleepy, you're hot and you're tired and you're sleepy, don't try to wake yourself up. And you can do that, but then you've done something artificial. From the point of view of meditators, keeping even a thin line of presence while you are hot and tired and sleepy is much more useful. You can get up and stretch and splash cold water on your face, then you sit down refreshed. But you haven't refreshed yourself from the source of refreshment, which is the unborn mind. You've refreshed it from a tap of cold water, self and other. You have continued duality as a method of achieving non-duality, which may not be logical. <laughs> so even if you're tired, be with the tiredness. The texts say this again and again. Don't do anything different. However the mind is, the ground of this experience is the Dharmakaya. This is the mind of the Buddha, nothing else. The mind, when you see the mind as it is, that's the Dharmakaya. When you don't see the mind as it is and you imagine some self, some concrete entity, then you have confusion. So hot and tired is a flow of experience. Oh, God, I can't do this. I'm too hot and tired. That's a conclusion. And on the basis of that, you want to interrupt the practice and, you know, have a shower or have some water or something. You don't believe the teaching about the practice, you believe your own conclusion is, I need a rest. I can't do it. Nobody's asking you to do it. All they're asking you to do is to sit hot and tired. That's not too difficult. A lot of us do it a lot of the time. I'm hot and I'm tired and I'm falling asleep. Be present with that. What is this as an experience? What is it to be hot? What happens? You get a bit hazy. Haziness is in the sky. The sky is always open. Sometimes it's blue. Sometimes light wispy clouds come. In the morning, sometimes you get mist. Sometimes you get storms. 
all of these events are in the sky. They are the showing of the hospitality of the sky. The sky is not afraid of clouds. It's not damaged by thunderstorms. Your mind is like the mirror, empty from the very beginning. If you are tired, your mind, as pure awareness, is not tired. Tiredness is arising like a dark cloud in the sky of your mind. I don't want this in my mind. It is in your mind. I don't want it, but it is. Uncontrived, this is a tired day. So the instruction is always better to have what you might call bad meditation than interrupt the meditation. Because it gives you the chance, if you're angry or you're bored or you're depressed, you're flooded by feelings or you've got great pain, your hips hurting, you can't get an operation, you need treatment, nobody cares, all kind of things going. So much movement in the mind today, it's like the weather. With the weather, at least you can get a weather forecast. With the mind, we don't know. This is current weather. That's all it is. If you believe in it, in a reductive way, it becomes the truth of you. But it's just passing through. That's why it doesn't sound rational. I'm falling asleep. What's the point of doing this? That might sound quite rational. The point is, when you come to a conclusion, you put in a full stop, and you say, there is nothing to be done. <clears throat> you say, why are you doing something? <laughs> Nobody asks you to do anything. All you require is sit on your bum. Sit on your bum, see what comes. That's all. But it shouldn't be this way. Padmasambhava never had that. His mind was always shiny. <laughs> That's why he's a statue. <laughs> <laughs> if we were to interview the real Padmasambhava, he probably has a tale or two to tell. It's like that. So, duality, polarities, good, bad, right, wrong, effective, ineffective, making progress, not making any progress, as soon as you have these oppositional readings, you're applying a map onto the territory. Stay with the territory. It's like this. This is how the mind is showing. You're not in charge of your mind, and how your mind is is not an x-ray of your soul. You don't have a soul. You don't have a definitive self. It's just how it is. How it is. And if you stay with that, you see how it is, is how the mind is showing. The clouds and the storm that's coming is how the sky is. It doesn't define the sky forever. It just shows how the sky is today. Because I'm not going blinkered about, oh my God, the storm's coming and we're going to have a picnic and all the people are going to come and what are we going to do? Will the food be wasted? A storm in the sky and a storm in my mind. That's what happens, isn't it? My, pa my plans are fucked. I feel like the sky. Stormy, upset. That's how it is. That's all it is. It's a storm. It's not final. It's not definitive. It's just this. So if we stay with this, however the mind is, without becoming an examiner, an inquisitor, a judge, we stay with the phenomena, nangwa, appearance, and appearance is always inseparable from emptiness. Without this, all you do is get into artificial meditation, in which you're trying to correct yourself all the time, you're wondering what other people are thinking. So if you're sitting and you need to lie down, you can lie down, you have to stretch your legs, you stretch your legs. Some people say you should never do this. You should just begin and go right through with the right posture. Why? If you move your leg, your mind is released from the pain in the knee. 
and is free to relax. If you're struggling with being in pain, you're preoccupied by the pain. Why? The body moves, speech moves, the mind moves. Movement is where it's in space. Go, if you stay with the central point, there, there is no uh, problem. Then finally, we have Rangsar Sha, which means Rangsar means, Rang means own, Sar means place, and Shak means to keep or to stay or to rest. Stay in your own place. It's like don't move, don't react. If the mind is in its own place, its own place is here and now. When the mind moves, it goes into the past, into the future. It goes into fabrication, elaboration. So stay with this. But I don't like it. I don't want it. This is hopeless. I can't do it. These thoughts come. If you stay here, they will go. The mind is unmoving. The content of the mind is always moving. If you leave the content of the mind alone, it will be self-liberating. If you get involved with the content of the mind and you try to correct it or shape it or make it go in a better direction, you will be part of the turbulence and there will be no end to that. Relax into the open. Of course, it doesn't feel very relaxing, and we can't do that because we're covered in hooks. We're like Velcro. We're locking on to all these things. We're just in that. That's attachment. What did the Buddha say? Attachment is the cause of suffering. That guy knew a lot. <laughs> so then we see the reason I'm suffering is not the, the semantic content or the the meaning tone content of what's arising, the cause of the suffering is the attachment. A good experience arises and you become attached to it. Then you sit later that day or the next day and it's not working. My meditation is no good. It was so good before. You're hanging on to an echo of something which has vanished, comparing and contrasting. Why do I never make progress? Why is my mind not stable? can go crazy with that. It is like this. My task is to be present with how it is, as it is, that's all. No judging, no comparing and contrasting, it's just this. What is it? It's just this. What does it mean? It is what it is. The rest is unnecessary conceptual elaboration. And the paradox is that if you do this, when you get up and you function in the world, you're right there. You're connected with everything. You're able to move around. The mind is bright and shiny. You haven't had to polish it because it is intrinsically bright. And when you artificially polish the mind, you make it dull, which is very, very sad. Why is that? Because the cloth that you use to polish the mind is a dirty cloth. It's a slimy cloth. It's a karmic cloth. I think we all know that. You have at home a little wiper for cleaning, and you look and time to throw it away. Get a fresh one. Fresh cloth, now it's clean. Fresh mind cleans the mind. But you're cleaning your mind with an old thought I shouldn't be like this. I wish I wasn't like this. That's a dirty cloth. And you're smearing your mind with neurotic judgment. And what will you get as a consequence? Suffering. Not so complicated. <laughs> but where do you get a clean cloth? That's the mind not dependent on thought. So you can run up and down these six. They're very useful. Little, it's almost like a little, very subtle adjuster. You're trying to find your balance. It's like Alexander technique. It's not enormously invasive, but you're having to find the line of grounded gravity. 
being alive is not a thing. You can't just sort of do it. It's very subtle. And it is lunchtime. <laughs> Good. Okay, so our focus is not about uh, being here now, because we are always here now. Our issue is not being here now. What is the distraction or evacuation or obscuration that hides from us our actual situation and keeps us trapped inside our imagined situation. So the first uh, text in the book is a short Doha by Saraha. And Saraha is a very, very intelligent, well-educated person who was curious. And that's one of the very beautiful things about Saraha. His mind goes in all different kind of directions and you know the famous story of him coming to a town and seeing this young woman making an arrow uh, with four stages to it and fashioning the the place to put the the feathers for the the flight <clears throat> and he's curious now he's from a brahmin family a high family very entitled kind of person but his curiosity took him across boundaries and barriers because he was concerned with what's there in front of him, with the phenomena, not with the concept. Many Brahmins would never go near a woman making arrows. She's from a very low caste. She's an outsider. <clears throat> so his whole orientation to the world was through his senses relating to what's there and not over-elaborating. So let's have a look at what he has to say. Unfortunately, my seeing has to be mediated through glasses, not direct anymore. <laughs> So, this word, the treasury, uh, it can mean like a royal treasury or like a box in which you would keep your jewels. It's a, it's a site of what is precious. These doors are considered to be very precious because they are spontaneous expressions of how it is. They are unfabricated and they come from a place of authenticity and if we open to them, they can help us to find our own authenticity. So he says, I pay homage to Sri Vajra Dakini. Vajra, as we know, means indestructible. The indestructible Dakini is the energy of the empty mind. Vajra Dakini manifests as harmonious movement, inharmonious movement. You can say everything is the energy of the Dakini. In, in Tibetan, as many of you know, the word for Dakini is Kandroma. Ka is sky. Droma means woman who's moving, the woman moving in the sky, or the energy moving in the sky. So the sky is the Vajra, it's the indestructible emptiness. What is moving in that is all of heaven and hell, all of samsara and nirvana, everything is moving in the sky. It doesn't move out of the sky, it moves in the sky. So this is the, the quality of Sri Vajra Dakini. We always begin by uh, paying homage to the sources of inspiration, which could be Buddha Dharma Sangha or the Guru, whatever, because we are not separate, we are not autonomous. 
there is no self-made Buddha. There is intrinsic Buddhahood, but there is no self-made Buddha. Like this common saying that people attribute to Africa, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it's the same. It takes a lot of samsara to make a Buddha. There are people who help the Buddha, there are people who hinder the Buddha, and the Buddha ripens through the turbulences of life. So, homage is accepting that although my awakening state is intrinsic to me, it is not a possession that I have. I am the flowering of the intrinsic, but for this flowering to occur, I have interacted with many, many people, and these people have helped me to write her. So, Nankai Norbu always said that when you <coughs> pay homage to your teachers, you must include your parents. Your parents helped you to learn to speak, to walk, to clean your teeth, to tidy your bedroom. They help you to function in the world, not to be too loud, not to be too withdrawn. Parents haven't carried out many things. They are also teachers, your school teachers, maybe your neighbors, your friends. These have all taught you. So when you recognize the gratitude that you have, you start to see, I am part of a moving environment impacted by how other people have been. They have given me gifts, whether this was intentional or not. It's not so much that people necessarily teach us. The issue is, can we learn from what is on offer? And if we learn to learn, then everyone becomes our teacher. And then we, in our turn, do whatever we do, and this influences some people, maybe in a formal way, maybe in an informal way. All of us are always impacting interactively the field of experience of other people. So, that involves us to be mindful, grounded, present and aware. Everybody has a part to play in universal awakening. That's why we say, may all beings be happy. And if we are open and we do our best, <clears throat> this will articulate all kinds of impacts and developments and ripenings in people we never meet. Lots of people have pictures of the Dalai Lama on their wall. They never met the Dalai Lama, they probably don't even read anything, but I think that looks quite a nice guy. Mm -hmm. And somehow there's some flavor of that. Many people have Buddha statues in their house. There's some quality of that that has a subtle influence on how they are. Mm -hmm. Then he says, I pay homage to the great bliss, innate, original knowing. Uh, the original knowing means the knowing which is there from the very beginning. It means it's not a, a fabricated knowing, it's not a learned knowing, it's not a developed knowing, it's simply knowing. What does it know? It knows what can be known without thinking. It is direct knowing. You, in our languages we might call it intuitive or spontaneous. It doesn't apprehend. It doesn't get hold of anything. It is the knowing which reveals that which is already always already. And it's called great bliss. Bliss can sometimes mean uh, an intense state. One of the qualities of when you feel very happy is that you feel kind of complete. You're like a circle. It may not last very long, but there's a oh. whole. So great bliss is a gesture towards the intrinsic completion of emptiness. Happiness comes and goes, sadness comes and goes. This is like the clouds and rainbows in the sky. The sky itself 
is great bliss because it's always open and always complete. We have always have to be careful because these formulations can be identified as something special. Oh, if only I could taste that great bliss. If only I could taste a really good Italian ice cream. <laughs> so you put it in your mouth without trying to, you swallow the bloody thing. <laughs> Gone. This is the nature of sensation. Great bliss means sensation. It's always vanishing. So it's not about special situations or wonderful this or wonderful that. It's the great bliss that we have to remember that this term great or maha in Sanskrit is indicating something without beginning or end, is indicating emptiness. What makes the bliss great is its emptiness, its ungraspability. Sometimes this is called a great satisfaction, simpa, to be content, to be satisfied. There's no lack, there's no excess, just enough. Oh, just like that. So if you're in each situation and you have enough space for whatever is arising, that's a satisfaction. You never get too much, we never get too little, because what we are concerned with is the non-dual connectivity of the arising and the ground. If you focus on what you take to be the feeling tone or the content of what's arising, and you cut that off from its ground, it arises as something, and this something can be compared to that something, and it's better or worse, I need more, I need less, and it becomes a commodity in the exchange mechanism of commodities. So great bliss is that which is connected with the ground. It's the reflection in the mirror. You can say, I prefer the look of this reflection to that reflection, but we can't really say this reflection is better than that reflection. If I say I prefer it, it's relational and it's relational in duality. I'm up here looking in the mirror, I see the reflection, this one appeals to me. It's good, it's good for you, good for you, take it back. No, it's good, no, it's good for you, that's all. That's all you can ever say, good for me, no, that's all. There is nothing there to pin your value judgment onto. That's why it's always good. Kuntu Zampo, Samanta Bhadra, the always good. It's always good because it's not a thing which can be evaluated. The goodness of Samanta Bhadra is that the emergent, the Hlundrup, the spontaneous display is inseparable from primordial purity. The pure ground, the open, empty ground, and what is displayed are inseparable. And so all the forms of display are not other than the breath or the shining face of emptiness. And that's how we might think of the great bliss. So although this is a, quite a short text, it's structured in uh, three sections, and the first has uh, three aspects to it, showing Mahamudra as it is. So in the first, he's, he's showing how it abides. Abide is meaning uh, nepa, which is to stay. It just, this is how it is. And as we've already looked many times now, how is important. Because how allows you to come close to something without taking hold of it. As soon as you say, what is it or why is it, that approach allows you to somehow have a sense that you can catch something here. But how is it is much more passive receptive. If you want to see how something is, 
you have to receive it. How was the movie? It means, how did that come to you? So it's not turning what occurs, the experience, into an object, but it's about how it is as you experience it. Now, the thing about Mahamudra is consciousness never gets Mahamudra. Awareness is the openness to the intrinsic presence of Mahamudra. It is beyond appropriation. It's never an object for the workings of the mind. You can't think about it. You can't uh, define it, but you can be close to it. You can be pervaded by it. You can find yourself at home within Mahamudra. So he says, now, animate and inanimate, means alive and dead, moving and non-moving, substantial and insubstantial, appearance and emptiness, everything, without exception, during all time, never deviates from the nature of space. So, space Space is, is not exactly a medium, but space is the, the great facilitator which facilitates nothing. Without space, there would be no experience. So the space is the space which is empty and therefore available for filling and emptying and filling and emptying, but it's intrinsically empty and it is the domain of awareness. So in Tibetan they say yin rig yerme, the yin, the, the sphere, the infinity of space, the space within which everything arises, is inseparable from awareness. The domain of awareness is always the site within which everything is happening altogether. There is no limit to it. We hear sounds, they are in this space. They arise in this space and vanish from this space. Everything, whether it's cars or buildings or a bill from the taxman or dog shit on your shoe, whatever occurs is always within space. That is to say, its fundamental status is non-dual with space. Space and, and space here is a way of talking about emptiness. Emptiness is no thingness. No thingness means non-opposition. When you see the clouds in the sky, they're moving through the sky. The sky is not opposed to them. The sky is not trying to keep them out. Whether they come in or go out, the sky is not affected. Same with the mirror and the reflection. So, everything which appears, whatever kind, any situation, whether you've encountered it before or not, is always a form of space. And the space of the mind is the domain of experience. So when we talk about things, and we remember that there are no things, what there are are experiences. We hear a sound, maybe a motorbike, that's a thought, I experience the sound, I experience the interpretation, maybe a motorbike, and then something else is experienced, and something else is experienced, and experiences are flowing this way and that. Mountains, trees, hot weather, cool weather, however it is, it is empty and present. It is, in another language, the presence of emptiness. The reflection is the showing of the potential of the mirror to show, and that potential is another way of saying it is empty. The mirror can show so much because it has no intrinsic uh, content of its own.
So he's starting to talk about our mind. He's not talking about something over there, something different. This space is me. This space is you. This is you. You have been alive for a while. All of us have traveled in different places, eaten different food, slept in different kinds of beds, met different kinds of people. All of these experiences have arisen and vanished. Arisen and vanished. This is your mind. If you had no space, all of this could not have occurred for you. If you were like a little wooden box, it would only have in it what somebody put into it. But what happens for you bubbles up. Sometimes feels like it arises in through you and out. Sometimes it seems to bubble up out there and come into you. The teachings always say, don't hold the world outside. Don't keep your mind inside. Experiences arising and sometimes it looks out, sometimes it looks in, sometimes it looks self, sometimes it looks other, but it's all experience. In this room, we look at each other, we see people, we don't see ourselves. Other people are my life. I'm not my life. I hardly see me. I see you guys. <laughs> this is a fact. You are my life. In all sorts of ways, you are what I see, you are what I attend to, you are who I relate to. I find myself in this way with you, in many ways because of you. So, when we make these sharp divisions of inside and outside and self and other, we have to really see what are, what are we doing. You're taking a finger and you're putting it in the bowl of water and you're writing your name. Only writing on water is dissolving and dissolving and dissolving. Whatever you assert is already dissolved in space because it is space. So this, this hopefully gives us a mood of, oh, okay. If my ground is space, Maybe I can relax. The space is already here. The issue is to open to my own ground rather than to find a better way to manifest. Why? Because manifestation is the quality of the ground, not the quality of the person. The person is a manifestation of the ground. So if we relax into and as the ground, we are at the very source of all manifestation. And then manifestation takes care of itself. That's why I say Klundrup, effortlessly arising, instant presence. In, or in uh, Hindi or Sanskrit, they say Sahaj. Sahaj means spontaneous, intuitive, immediately just this. <coughs> then he helps us a lot. He says, although you repeat space, space, the essence of space has no reality at all. So although he's saying, yes, everything is emptiness, this emptiness or space is not some parallel universe or some secret quintessence. It's not a metaphysical character. It's not a some hidden essence. The essence of space, what space really is, is nothing at all. There's no reality to it. No reality means it never becomes a substance. So although everything is space, that means it is nothing. And yet if everything is space and you experience everything, or at least lots of things, Space is not nothing at all. It has no reality, but that doesn't mean nothing at all. So, again, what you'll find here is navigating on the middle way. The middle way is not like some big autobahn that you just zoom around very fast. It's not a straight road. The middle way is a bit bendy because life is coming at us in all kind of weird patterns. And you find the middle way by 
recentering in a moving field. As if, say, you were out in the country and you're running up a hill and down a hill, the angle of the hill you're running, you have to shift the angle of your body so as not to fall over. You remain grounded even at a funny angle because the ground is at a funny angle. If the ground was flat, oh, I don't know where I am. But now you're running and maybe you come to some scree where you get loose stones and you could be sliding down them. You have to run up the hill a bit and you're finding a balance. That's the middle way. Is the way of balance which is dynamic. So when we say, when he's saying here, it has no space itself, has no reality, it means don't get smug, don't become complacent, don't think you found out what it is, don't fall asleep on the job. There is nowhere to get to, it's just present. So there's no end, just present. And you can lose presence. How do we lose presence? Well, that's what we find out in the meditation. You're sitting, you seem to be here, and then you're not here. You haven't gone anywhere, but you're not here. You're carried away, moving by a thought. You merge in the thought. Who merges in the thought? Dualistic attention merges in the thought. How can I prevent that happening? By not moving, by being like space. Mm -hmm. How will I do that? By not making space real or what arises in space real. It's not very real and it's not very important. And yet it is. <laughs> existing, not existing, neither existing nor not existing or something else. It transcends being any such object. It means whatever conceptual category you develop, you can't place the ground or the sphere of experience inside that. It cannot be thought about. So what he's saying is relax. Don't try to work it out. Don't try to make it happen. Don't try to do it. It is already happening. And what blocks you being aware and present with it happening is that you're already tilted out of yourself into the future. Well, this is quite complicated already. I don't know if I can understand it. What's he on about? I'll need to read this again. I really think, oh. Make a plan, study program. We should have a little study group so we can read this and think about it. <laughs> oh, good idea. So how do we make use of this? It's a caress. It's just a caress. I remember years ago when I spent a lot of time in Nam Kai Nor, he always said, never take any notes in a teaching. That's not what it is. It's just a massage. When you listen with a cognitive appreciation and you're trying to understand, it's not about understanding. The understanding is the structure of dualism. There's something to get. There's nothing to get except relaxation. And so the formulation of these songs or these words is, is designed to say, it's okay. This is how it is. Don't worry. It's already the case is not up to you. You don't need to make it happen. Actually, you can't make it happen. Oh, so you're worried that there seems to be something you don't get. Well, there is nothing. You just said there's no reality, so you can't get it. So the reason you don't get it is there is no it to get, and you're not very good at getting. <laughs> So there's no need to keep trying to get, because this is the ungettable. Now this can be like being kicked in the head. It, it could be this guy's just fucking around with us. You know, he's just, you know, making this kind of superior Brahmin shit stirrer. No, oh, you ordinary people, you dumb clucks. <laughs> Don't think so. But he's saying, 
you will not find it by looking outside yourself. And you won't find it by looking inside yourself. You find it by being here with. That's why we practice with our eyes open. <clears throat> Withness is everything. The whole cannot be found inside. It can't be found outside because inside and outside are the whole. So it's being with. Thus, space, mind, actuality have not the least difference. All names indicating difference are just incidental labeling. They are nothing but meaningless false words. Well, in Buddhism, there's a lot of technical vocabulary. You can spend a lot of time trying to get explanations for it so you know what it means. And he's saying, they are meaningless false words. The Dharma Dhatu, Padmasambhava, is a word. Buddha nature, pure from the very beginning. They, they conjure up some feeling tone, and that's the key thing. They are, as I say, a kind of massage, hopefully a loosening, where you start to feel, it's okay. It's okay. Nothing special to be done. When I was with Siya Lama and we would be doing a practice, at that time there were only five of us there, and he, he always calls his wife and he says, bring the bottle. So she comes in with this Shangri-La Sikkimese whiskey, and we all have a big measure of whiskey, and then we begin the puja. Because <laughs> he's too serious, too serious. It's like that. Don't try so hard. Of course, you have to be there, but not tensing up. And most of us, when we try, we tense. I remember sometimes when it was exam time in the university I was teaching in, I would be, we say, the invigilator in an exam. And you sit on a high chair and you look on this hall of people all writing their exams. It's such an incredible, dense, Atmosphere. It's just writing something. Don't worry, it's okay. That's what you can end up with in the practice. Too much is at stake. I'm going to die. I've got to get there. I've got to do it. No. You're going to die. It's already okay. Trust that it's okay. But how can I be sure? You can't be. You can't be. It's okay. So he's saying st some study is important, but recognize language is conventional. Yesterday we looked at these four stages of ignorance. The oblivion of consciousness emerging into emptiness and trying to make sense of it but not being able. The second level, consciousness formulating this, the basic structure of duality, self and other. And then the third stage, the naming of the experiences, the naming of the aspects of mental consciousness and naming the experiences of mental consciousness, cars, rye bread, butter, and so on, many different things. These are all conventional names, conventional identifications. It doesn't mean there's nothing there. There is diversity without substance. And because there's diversity, it looks as if there's something. But when you see that something is actually the showing of nothing, like the reflection in the mirror. So the name is naming a form of nothing. It's not for naming a substance. But the danger with the name is that it gives you the sense of being able to hook and separate that particular form of experience, like catching a fish and pulling it out of the water into the boat, got something. Of course, the fish will die. The, the bright vitality of that moving experience is now a corpse. That's what you catch. You catch a corpse. You catch a ghost. You catch an echo. Living 
is living now, always now. So that's why he's saying, whatever knowledge you have of Dharma, keep it light, keep it easy, and, and move on the surface of things. Don't try to find some essence inside. There is a, a kind of bug that you get on ponds. We call it a, a boatman. And it has quite long legs, a bit like a, a, a spider up on long legs. And it walks on the water. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What do you call that in German? That's a lot of Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> very good. Lovely. <laughs> So, that's how we should be, just walking on the surface of everything, very light. It moves around, it has some kind of light, they skitter very fast, they seem to be up to something. So, not too serious and not falling into the water. It's able to use the surface tension of the water as a support. That's an amazing thing. If we step on the water, we plonk through that. So. That's, that's the invitation to see the conventional nature of these meanings. All phenomena are one's own mind. We have phenomena here. We have the things that we see. We see people. We see trees. We see houses. These are phenomena. These are appearances. These are patterns of light. These patterns appear and are gone. They have no substance. So he's saying, all these phenomena are one's own mind. That is to say, what you call a phenomena, which seems to be on the cusp, on the edge of becoming something, it's a phenomena because it is appearing for you, and what appears for you is experience. It's not entirely subject, it's not entirely object. It's your mind, but you can't just wrap it in your mind and say, oh, it's just a dream. It's like a dream, but it's not a dream. So then he says, other than one's own mind, there is not even an atom of an entity. So we look around the world, we see in the parking lot different kinds of cars, some may be quite expensive, some a bit old and battered, different cars representing people's different interest in cars or socioeconomic status. There are all kinds of ways that we can apply our semiotic capacity to interpret the world as a sequence of signs, a system of signs. This is mental activity. Whatever you think about something doesn't establish it as truly existing. It establishes it as something established according to the pattern currently applied in the task of establishing. <laughs> yeah. You get arrested by the police in some countries and it doesn't matter if you are innocent or guilty because the police need to arrest a certain number of people and you do. And if they find you've got a foreign passport, they might want to get rid of you because you're trouble or they might want to keep you because the politicians can use it for bargaining. So what happens in your trial has nothing much to do with you, but it determines how your life is going to be. So, this is experience. There is no internal, self-existing substance that says, I am a fact, I determine what it is, I am what I am. Everything's up for grabs. Everything's up for grabs. See what happened in, uh, in Afghanistan. When this uh, Taliban came back, status of women just vanished, just like that, gone. Done. The women who were head of police, who were judges in the courts, powerful, intelligent women wanting to bring up a new generation of girls, suddenly they're the targets. And their qualities that made them like shining lights 
in that brief semi-democratic moment turns them into objects to be locked up or killed. Conventional identification. There is no true essence in anything. That's what he's saying. It's all experience. You cannot stabilize it. Now that is terrifying. If you think that appearances are real. <laughs> they're real and we want to keep them safe. No, no, they're not real. But if you get a slap, you get a slap. It's not real, but it hurts. <laughs> because the pain is an experience, which is vanishing. It's not real, but ouch. Real means res, means having an existence of its own, existing as an entity. That's what he means. Something which is self-originating, self-defining, taking up its own place in the world. He says, there is not one of these to be found anywhere. All appearances arise in dependent co-origination, mutually influencing, and all having the status of evolution. So then he says, whoever awakens to the primordial non-existence of mind gains the holy vision of the victors of the three times. So the victors of the three times means the Buddhas, the uh, Jinas of the three times. Their holy vision is the integrity of the three uh, modes of the Buddha, Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, Nimalakaya. Let's go. They come to take our ignorance away. <laughs> it's very nice of them. And he's saying, whoever awakens to the primordial non-existence of mind has exactly the same understanding as the Buddha. The primordial non-existence of mind is you are the energy of the mind. You don't have a mind. The mind is not a thing you have, but here you are in this very moment, life shining through you, through the senses. This mind is not a thing. It's neither existent nor non-existent. It is the presence, the presence of the illumination or the luminosity of the mind. So the emptiness of the mind is a dharmakaya. The luminosity is this experience, this all at onceness, this sahaj. And within that, you are the particularity of this specific mode of manifestation, the nirmanakaya. These are not terms referring to something else, somewhere else, that some higher, better people have. This is the accurate description of your own situation. If if you see it. So that's why he's saying whoever awakens to it, that the ground of everything you ever experience is the mind. And the mind is non-existent. It is not born. So the Bible says around you, it's just there by itself. It's not created. It hasn't come out of something into existence. It doesn't go from non-existence into an existence. It is. When you look for your mind, you can't find it. Okay, so let's do a little practice around this. So, you sit in a comfortable way. Let your skeleton carry all the weight, all the tension, so your muscles are very relaxed and easy, your diaphragm's easy, breathing in and out. Your gaze is open into the space in front of you. We relax into that. You're here, not inside, not outside. Everything is all at once. When you settle into this a little bit, we start to explore familiar five questions. Oh. You're here. 
your ex you, your hearness is your experience of hearness. This is the illumination of your mind. Does your mind have color or shape? So you want to take that question up in a very light and delicate way so that it's just almost like a, a key that's opening yourself to a, a particular flavor of attention. I'm here, there is experience. This experiencing mind, does it have a color or a shape? Okay, we do that for a little bit. Okay, so remember that our interest is direct perception, not interpretation. So always, if you start from the map, if you start from the assumption, oh, my mind is in my brain, my brain is in my body, that's where it is and it looks like this, then you've told yourself a story. We are concerned to just leave the stories on the shelf and stay directly present with the unfolding of the ceaseless flow of experience and see in that process what is revealed to you. Does the mind have a shape? Is it square? Is it round? Whenever you come to a conclusion and you, th you think you have clarity, allow that conclusion to be present in your mind and see what happens. As we've already noticed, every arising thing is a vanishing thing. Everything is self-arising and self-liberating. So all the answers to the questions are already going. Maybe the answer to the question is not what you think it is. So you can spend a lot of time looking for the right answer. The key thing is to attend to how you ask the question. If you have a small pot, you will get a small answer. If you have a big pot, you have the chance to get a big answer. So always, how big is my pot? And the more you think, and the more knowledge you weave, your pot will shrink. So it's always, if you start to get a bit tight, relax into the out breath and just receive the flow of experience as it unfolds. And the, the question is best posed into that dynamic flow. Secondly, we have the question, is the mind big or small? Does it have a size? Is it something that could fit inside your body? Is it bigger than your body? Does it contain your body? When you hear a sound and you have the thought, oh, that's a plane in the sky, is that outside your mind or inside your mind? When you just hear, you have the first without conceptualizing. Have you already received this, the sound? The sound has come. Yeah, sounds are emerging all the time. It's over there. You go over there. How far is that? Now that's a conceptual interpretation. With the emergence of the sound, the sound in its first register is in your mind. Once you conceptualize it, you can do location, duration, and all these computations. Stay with the first sensation. How big is my mind? What size is it? Okay, so we do that a little.
Okay. So I say all phenomena are inseparable from your mind. It's just your mind. We hear, <clears throat> when we're sitting, we hear these diverse sounds. <clears throat> if we hear them as phenomena, as emergent moments of experience, and don't conceptualize them, and then do conceptualize them, I think you notice the difference. Once you conceptualize it, it's as if you apply a, a matrix or a grid in which you can plot the movement of the siren across the space, that it's going from one side to the other, and you can imagine what the distance away from this building is. That's your mind inventing a story. Stay with the phenomena itself. And it gives you a sense of the space of the mind. This is, the phenomena is moving in the space of the mind. The concept is like an architect mapping out how you can use the space to construct your interpretation. Inside, outside. Direct perception and conceptual interpretation are very different. Whenever you find yourself immersed in a riff of conceptualization that seems to be able to grasp hold of what's going on and tell yourself an explanatory story, relax in the out-breath, return to the senses, but not located in your sense organs. Open to what's arriving. Pure receptivity. In How is that? So then, we sit in. You might believe if we didn't have a mind, there wouldn't be anything going on. So we have a mind. Does this mind come from somewhere? Does it arrive? Have we ever not had a mind? We've certainly not had different kinds of experiences. Summertime, it's difficult to imagine winter. You look, sit out on the veranda, you see these piles of wood, you think, what the, what's that for? It's so hot. What do you want to keep wood for? If we were here in January, we think, oh, how blessed is the wood. <laughs> Don't get burned all at once. So the the uh, the way in so noisy place in the country. <laughs> the, 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 the impacting of phenomena, we already start to see how we take hold of it. Because our consciousness, the dualistic consciousness, is scanning the environment, looking for signs and symbols to interpret, to make its construct. Relax out of that. Mind is here. Did this mind come from somewhere? So we sit with that. Okay. Here. Mind is here. Is your mind somewhere here? Does it have a location? Is it inside? Is it outside? Does your mind rest anywhere? Does it abide? So again, we look for this. Okay. Then finally, the fifth question. <clears throat> Does the mind go someplace? Does your mind ever vanish? Does it seem to leave you? Does it seem to go somewhere? Is there another location where your mind could go from here to there? So, I just have a gentle look.
Okay. Well, I don't want to say too much about these five questions because they are very precious for meditators and you need your own fresh direct experience of them. If you, if you think about it too much or you read books and you get, as it were, the right answer, it won't really help you because you'll simply insert that conceptualization in the place of openness. <clears throat> so keep returning to the question, can I define my mind? Is it an entity? Is it something which can be described and then placed in comparison to other things? Is this the movement of the mind? Can the movement of the mind catch the mind? This is what you're looking to see. So, he says, it is well named as the casket of Dharma, means the container of Dharma. Dharma here meaning truth, the teaching of the Buddha, the teaching of Samantabhadra, Dorji Chang, the, just how it is. It is not some other mistaken Dharma. That's to say, it's not a, something somebody has thought up. It's not the product of human conceptualization. It's a revelation. The Dharma traditions are very, very clear when you read the lineage prayer. We always go through the same things. In the Nyingma system, you say, Kunzang Dorsan, Garab Shiri Singh, from Kuntuzangpo to Vajrasattva to Garab Dorji, and then the tradition continues. The lineage starts with the Adi Buddha, the first Buddha. And the difference between the Adi Buddha and all the other Buddhas is that the first primordial Buddha never got enlightened. They bypassed samsara. They bypassed the pathway through ignorance. They have been enlightened from the very beginning. All the other Buddhas, you can read, they have their history about what they went through and how they found doors opening and awakened. So the lineage begins with the unmediated, spontaneous revelation of this. Because of the quality of this, it was possible to hear that. So Vajrasattva, whose name is indestructible being, this potential of purity in the Sambhogakaya <clears throat> was illuminated or receive, able to receive what was offered by Samantabhadra. So what you have is the transmission from uh, Kuntuzampo to Vajrasattva is Buddha's mind-to-mind -mind transmission. Then from Vajrasattva to Garab Dorji, it's a symbolic transmission. And then Garab Dorji, when he teaches his first uh, Dzogchen, the famous three statements, it goes from his heart, through his voice, as he's floating in the sky, into the ears of the first recipients, and that's the third level of transmission it, into the human ear. So you have the same in the Kajupa lineages. You start with Dorji Chang, and then you go down Dorji Chang to Tilopa, Tilopa Naropa, Naropa to Marpa, Milarepa, Gampopa, and so on. It starts with the unborn, the undeveloped, the intrinsic, and that's for Tibetans anyway, incredibly important. It's not created, it's not a product of intellectual effort or a good idea that in arose in someone's mind. And that's why you can trust it. It is this uh, truth about our own mind that it is not a thing is is a true dharma 
because it is the primordial innate essence. Each of us, we're here sitting with our personalities, our habitual thoughts, our hopes and fears, all this kind of mental furniture that we're a bit cluttered with. It's a bit like if you, if you go to visit someone in a flat you've never seen before, they open the door and you go in and you see, oh, there's the table, the chair, some painting on the wall or whatever. You see the furniture. You don't really see the space of the, the room. If you're an architect, you might see that. If you are an estate agent, you might see the space of the room, but mainly we see the furniture. So that's what we're engaged with. It's how's your furniture? Could my furniture make friends with your furniture? What kind of personality do you have? But you couldn't have any furniture if you didn't have the space. The space is fundamental. The furniture is secondary. Now, when you put furniture, when if you get a new flat and it's completely empty, there's a lot of potential. You buy some furniture, you put it in a flat, and the seeming potential of the flat is lost because it's just this. This is how my room is. This is my flat. This is how I live. In the same way, when you have your habitual mental constructions, this is me. I am defined by my mental furniture, my likes, my dislikes, and so on. This furniture would not be available to you without the space of the mind. But you don't care about the space of the mind because you're worried that I've got a bit of a problem with anger and I got in a fight and it shouldn't have happened and I'm sorry it happened, but I didn't like that person. You go round and round and round and round, jumping from one chair to another in this furniture storage of your mind. And he's saying, ah. The space of the mind cannot be destroyed, cannot be lost. That is primordial. That is the openness of your presence. So however you are, whether you're happy or sad, fulfilled in your life, lost, confused, whatever structure you seem to experience your life as being, that is contingent, expressive, communicative, but non-essential. It doesn't define the truth of your being. The truth of your being is the hospitable space of the mind which is currently hosting this configuration of furniture. So if you, if you awaken to the space of your mind, my mind is unborn, it's not a thing but it fills with these patterns, which are also not things, then stillness and movement, silence and sound <clears throat> are not in opposition. And the flow of patterns and movement as the potential of the ground is unceasing. But if you become intoxicated with the movement, and that leads to a forgetfulness of the openness of the ground, then life's events are slamming into you again and again, and you're disturbed and you're moving this way and that. So this is what he's saying. There are no true entities. There is nothing fixed. There is nothing defined. So when you come to a conclusion about yourself or about other people, this is a delusion. This is something you imagine. It feels true, but the feeling tone is not sufficient proof for truth. It feels true, and then it vanishes. Stay with the space. This is the, the main thing he is pointing to here. So whenever we do our practice and we just relax and open, it's pointing to opening yourself to the unborn, infinite openness of the mind. Then he says, the thusness of this is not something that can be taught. So we can talk about it a bit. And that's a, just a kind of gentle encouragement to loosen yourself up, not take yourself too seriously, not be so burdened by 
the weight of who you think you are or your guilt or shame about bad things or your joy at the success of other things, but just to loosen up, oh, big space, big world, small me. And in that, you see, oh, I can learn. And we learn by receiving. It can't be taught because it can't be shown, but you can perceive it. And you perceive it with your heart. The mind is in the heart. The heart is like the sky. This is, this is, this is, this is. Nobody can show you that because if they showed it to you, they would have to show you something. You find yourself opening when you stop closing yourself. So the hand is open, moves around. The hand can do lots of things. The hand catches something. I've caught my pen. Lucky me, I've lost my hand. I love my pen and I'm happy to lose my hand for a while. But now I want a cup of tea, but I don't want to lose my pen. What shall I do? <laughs> tea or pen? Tea or pen? I have to put down the pen to get the tea. When the hand is free, pen or tea. <laughs> if you only have the pen, then it's not so good. So then you see, fuck, I spend my whole life hanging on to things, hanging on to the past, hanging on to my sense of who I am, hanging on to my imagined futures, and my hand closes. That is to say, my potential closes. I have the power of the contraction, but also the impotence of the contraction, because the potency of life is to engage, to communicate, to relate. So, this is what he's pointing to very strongly. Nobody can show you this, but what they can do is encourage you, relax, trust, be with yourself and your, whatever we call it, true self, real nature, Buddha nature, will show itself because it's always been there, but it won't show itself as furniture. It's not a thing with a shape and a color. It can't be apprehended. It will show itself when you are inseparable from it. So, oh, it's like this. So he says, it's beyond expression. No one can understand it. So, this is very, very helpful. No one can understand it. All the mental effort that we use to try to understand the Dharma, to try to make sense of things, you will never get there because it's not the graspable, and it's not the grasping, it is the intrinsic. The mind is the space within which the pulsation of energy which is grasped and grasping, these two are moving together all the time. You grasp and release, grasp and release. It's a pulsation, it's flowing, unfolding, and, unfolding, and it never ends. It's just on and on. So, why are we here? What, what, what on earth are we studying? If we're studying something that can't be understood. <laughs> well, what you're studying is yourself. You're not studying ideas about Dharma. You're not training to be some Dharma scholar. You're trying to stop being an orphan. Where is my mum? I want my mum. You're not my mum. You're not my mum. Where's my mum? Where's my mum? <laughs> you run around in the world. Maybe you're my mum. Do you do adult adoption? <laughs> I'm house trained, you know. <laughs> desperate. We're desperate. We're so hungry. We're so needy. Where's my mum? Your mum is already here. You have never left your mother's womb. The mother is Prajnaparamita, the unborn wisdom of emptiness. 
you are living in the womb of the Great Mother. All the Buddhas of the three times are born within the womb of the Great Mother. They're not born out of the womb. They're born into the womb of the Great Mother. Delusion is to be born out of the integrity of the unborn Dharma Dhatu. That's what ignorance is. In the first moment of ignorance, you think, oh, here I am. I'm me, self-existing, no mother, no father, just me. Hi. <laughs> That's the slightly manic first moment. <laughs> then it's a little bit sad, a little bit lonely. Have I got a friend? Would you be my friend, my best friend? <laughs> my best friend's got a new best friend. No, I don't have a friend. It's very hard to be a child. You encounter this all the time. Where will I locate myself? Because you're looking to the object to rescue you. The subject seeks the object for fulfillment. But Zokpa Chempo, the great fulfillment, the great completion, Mahamudra, the completion, the whole, can't be completed because it's already whole. The lack is a delusion. The completion is intrinsic. Don't go looking to complete yourself rest in the always already complete. That's the entire teaching of the book. We can all go home now. <laughs> but we are a little bit... <laughs> hey, bravo, let's communicate. <laughs> we have to visit again and again. Again and again, because we don't absorb it. We can't believe it could be like that. There's this famous story, <clears throat> you may well know it, about Pato Rinpoche. And he had a very close student who was with him for many, many years. And again and again he said to Pato Rinpoche, I don't get it. I hear all the words, I read the words, I, I can even teach the words, but I don't know what they mean. So Pato Rinpoche said, ah, let's go for a walk. So they walk outside, it's a nice evening. He said, oh, let's sit down, so let's lie down. He said, lie down, so lie down. The dog is barking. Do you hear the dog? Do you see the stars? This is it. <laughs> this is it. And that is true. He wasn't che cheating him or mocking him. This is it. Whatever it is, this is it. But we are not quite centered. We're not quite aligned. We're off balance. And so we're already trying to rectify ourselves when actually, truly, we're not off balance. You cannot be off balance because however you are is in the center of the infinite Dharma Dhatu. But believing you're off balance, you want to get what you need, which will be something else. And it's that very yearning for something else which maintains you being off balance. Now, that's very sad. This is it. Yeah, but what does it mean? That's how you lose it. This is it. You have to be available to receive everything which is being offered to you moment by moment, forever and ever. Your ego self cannot receive everything. Your awareness can receive everything. When you grasp the pen, this is the activity of the ego self that says, I want something. And the Buddha says, nothing is better than something. <laughs> but actually, it's not so difficult because every something is a form of nothing. When you hold the pen, you're already holding nothing. Fuck off. I got something. I've got something. But the something is nothing. Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. If you stay with that, then you realize there is nothing to be changed, nothing to be developed. It's just this, as it is. And time for tea. So he says, if there is an owner, there will be possessions. Well, that's very clear. I mean, the way he speaks is very, very sweet. In order to be established as a mother, you have to have a child. If you don't have a child, you don't become a mother. 
if you want to be uh, an owner, you have to have something to own. Then he says, yet from the beginning there has been no self, so what could it possibly possess? The notion of owner is a sign or a name or a conventional interpretation. We might think, this is my body, but in what way do we own our body? We don't make our heart beat. We don't digest our own food. We, we, uh, our claim to ownership is false. As the anarchist uh, philosopher Proudhon said, property is theft because everything is stolen. In the Tibetan uh, language, when they talk about the sins of body, speech and mind, the way they express stealing is machimbalempa, taking what is not given. That's very powerful because that means there is nothing which is yours except under particular circumstances. So when the British went to Australia and they identified the Aborigines as subhuman and therefore not entitled to an equal relationship, they were able to take it. Well, nobody gave it to them. The Aborigines didn't want to give it to them but they were regarded as not having the power to resist, so there could be no proper treaty. I take what is not given. What is actually given to me? In the Bible, you learn when you're at school, maybe the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. That's what you're entitled to, a bit of bread. If you're kind to us, that's what we need give us our daily bread. We have nothing. We have nothing. The big demon in our time is entitlement. People feel entitled, like Trump felt entitled to be completely deceitful about the results of the election and his role on the, the march in Washington <laughs> and so on. And we have to remember entitlement is not a personal quality, it's a legal term. It means having the title deeds to something, like you have maybe to a property or to the land. What are we entitled to? It's always conventional. We have from the United Nations a universal bill of human rights, which should entitle people to freedom and non-persecution and so on. It doesn't mean anything. These are conventions. And unless someone can enforce the Convention on Human Rights, it doesn't exist. But because it's a convention, convention means blowing together, <laughs> like 10 people blowing into one balloon. It's just puff, puff. And all over the world, you see, it's not worth a bag of beans. It doesn't do anything doesn't stop you being attacked, raped, murdered, it's abstract, in the clouds. Well, this is very important, what he's saying. If you approach the world in terms of entities, in terms of things, ownership becomes very important, and anything can be transformed into a commodity. You can sell your blood. We know that in many countries there is harvesting of vital organs for operations. People get drugged and cheated and taken into operating theaters and the kidneys removed. In fact, they could be murdered in the process and they could take out all these vital organs because somebody wants them. Mm. Somebody sees you are a means to an end. Mm. You are a method for my satisfaction. You are not an end in itself. I don't see you. I don't respect you. You don't mean anything to me. And when somebody adopts that position, you are just something to be moved around on the checkboard of their life plan and their desires. 
So this is a very, it has profound ethical implications as well. If I don't possess, then it's not really mine. So what arises then, if you take this into your heart, is gratitude. Like the Bible says, like in Islam they say, Inshallah, God willing, this will arise. If the gods are kind, we will find wind, as it says in the Odyssey. It's not up to me, and I am not entitled. Therefore, I have to work with circumstances. That's really what that means. I have to be in touch with the field of experience, not try to dominate it, not be a merciless slave at the mercy of things, but try to find a way to be with things and not allow myself to become a commodity and not turn other people into a commodity because, as he says, there are no entities. If there are no entities, if there's nothing which could be possessed, then commodity uh, structures are, are insane, which is what we see in modern capitalism. We are all at the mercy of the real enemy, which is not really China or Russia, it's hedge funds. Hedge funds are unaccountable, free-floating money, which can be invested and divested at somebody's whim in the search for more profit. They are without ethics, they're not intended to bring value. It's free-floating commodities. So money, as the neutral abstracted indicator of value, causes enormous damage. It's not like the same as, I'll, I'll exchange my cow for your three goats. <laughs> Barter at least involved two people having some sense of a palpable object of transaction. So the more abstract the situation continues to be in, the more danger we're in. For example, when slavery was rife and the especially British and French boats were going on this triangle, going down to uh, buy slaves, taking them over to the Caribbean, getting sugar, which is made into rum, and taking that up into America, and, or taking the slaves up into America, and then back to Britain with the cotton and the rum and so on. These slaves were just commodities. They were thought of as something for exchange. And of course, as we know, many of them died on the journeys. So they just threw them overboard because they only had value when you were able to take them to the slave market and put them on the stage and sell them. They became chattel. They became possessions and things. It's a terrible thing to do. And when you think of somebody in those terms, what you do is you turn down the possibility of empathy because they are radically other. They're not like us. These are inferior beings. They're, just, they're, they're like animals. Look at them. Dirty, they don't wash, they never give them any water. They smell. How could they clean themselves? In that way you can see this is our human history. This is what human beings can do commodify other human beings. So, again, this is, I believe, this whole uh, book is a profound uh, encouragement to develop deep ethics and deep awareness of the violence which is inherent in commodification, in the identification of people as things. The antidote to that is not a charter of human rights. It's an awakening to the bright freshness of each being. It's the capacity to look in someone's eyes and see the life in their eyes. If you look in their eyes, how would you treat them in that way? You'd have to see it. But you, when you look in someone's eyes, you have to receive their life that's flowing out of their eyes into your eyes and then take that into your heart. And then you respond. And you go, oh, hello. Hello. Somebody's there. That's an amazing thing. And if you decide not to do that, life's much easier on one level because then you can cheat people, 
and coerce them and bully them. These big multinational corporations, they look for the bright graduates from the good universities and they take them in when they're 21 and they put them at the bottom of the shit heap. And there's a lot of people out there, big, fat, successful men, who produce a lot of shit to shit on these young people. Be in the office at 7 in the morning, oh yes. Don't leave the office before anyone else, oh yes. 10 o'clock at night, can I go home? Still some mad fucker in the room with an ounce of cocaine up his nose working all night to make more money. <laughs> you can't go home. That's what, how these things are, these big, big famous companies. Wrecked people, enslaved into the fantasy of proper promotion. Every year they dispense with 10% of the staff to bring in new people. <sighs> food, shit, food, shit. Food for a year, then you're shit. That's how we treat people. And why do people put themselves into voluntary slavery? Because they want to get to the top of the dung hill, where they can crawl like a cockerel four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Maserati, <laughs> penthouse. <laughs> <laughs> like the Bible says, don't sell your soul for a mess of pottage. Pottage there means like cheap food. Don't do it, don't sell yourself. Don't make yourself a commodity, don't make other people a commodity. This is profound. The real pretend defense against this is to awaken to the unborn nature of the mind. <clears throat> if the mind exists as something, then all phenomena will exist as something. If the mind does not exist, who would be able to know phenomena? So this is a little bit of a conundrum. He sets up these uh, little things. So if the mind exists as something, then all phenomena will exist as something because the mind is the origin and the guarantor of what's occurring. I am real, you are real. Subject is real, object is real. So if I exist, you exist, the trees exist, the dog exists, the shoes exist. But do I exist? The mind is empty. The mind is this uh, bright, illuminating field of instant experience. And the mind is this particular posture and gesture of the moment which is already vanishing. Does that exist? No, but it appears. It appears. Don't conflate, don't run together <clears throat> and make as one appearance and existence. The reflection in the mirror appears, but it doesn't exist. The reflection of the moon in water appears and doesn't exist. The mirage on the hot summer's road appears and doesn't exist. We have 12 famous examples of illusion. They all appear, but they don't exist. So when he says, if the mind does not exist, who would be able to know phenomena? So the mind exists in the, he's playing a little with language. He's using quite a strong verb. In a sense, he's saying the mind exists in the sense of being present. You can't say it's non-existent. It's nothing at all. It exists but it is not an existent. It, it doesn't, its existence or hereness doesn't condense into a continuing existent which endures through time. It's not a thing, but you can't say it's not there at all because we have experience. Experience is the proof of the vitality and life of the mind. You, have, you can't have experience without the mind. It's the big light that switches on and shows everything. So again, he's highlighting the middle way. You can't say it's really something, but you can't say it's nothing. So we're back to form is emptiness, emptiness is form. If people don't really exist, why would you 
treat them badly. These are illusory forms. Light, openness, playfulness. So then he says, all that appears as mind and phenomena are not found if sought for and there is no seeker anywhere. So he's saying the, the end of the last verse, he's saying we're not dead, something's happening, here we are, all of this, color, sound, people moving their bodies and so on, this, this, that's definitely this. All that appears as mind, as mind here is meaning the content of the mind, feelings, thoughts, consciousness and so on, and phenomena. So the, if you like, the outer objects, the things you see, touch and so on, the inner objects, the furniture of the mind, the memories, thoughts, all of these things are not found if sought for. That is to say, as long as you believe they exist, it is as if they exist. But once you actually look for them, you can't find them. I have a thought. I had a thought yesterday. It was really interesting. Let me tell you about it. I got something. And it's like sand going through your fingers. It's already gone as you get it. You didn't get anything. Here's my son. This is, this is tricky. It's like you look in the pond on the full moon night, you see the moon. The moon is in the pond. No, it is. Look, no, no, but it's not. It is. It isn't. It is. It isn't. Mirage on the road. Look at the water. <gasps> no water. Water. No water. Water. No water. This is our life. It appears, but there's nothing behind the appearance. And when you fall into samsara, you misread the appearance as the sign of something according to your perverse semiotic interpretation, if I see water, it's because there is water. I'm not stupid. I'm not stupid. Water. Water. <laughs> Mirage. Water. <laughs> Look, it's water. If I see water, there must be water. No, it's a mirage. But once you catch that, then you see you do that all the time. Car. Mirage. There's no car there. Just as you imagine the water that's in front of you with a mirage, you imagine car with that shape. The shape, the color, the formation arises and you insert true existence, separate existence into the object. <clears throat> it doesn't mean you can't get in and drive it. But what you're driving is your idea. That's why you have to drive carefully. <laughs> so, <clears throat> when you look for things and you can't find them, you also see that there is no seeker because the one who believes in the real object becomes real to themselves through the reality of the object. I am formed in the very moment of forming the object. This is a house. This is my house. I see the house. <clears throat> I identify it as my house. The house makes me. The solidity that I impute to the house is a parallel uh, solidity I impute to myself. So when you see that the object is an illusion, you can also see the subject is an illusion. And remember, an illusion is the Mahayana way of thinking about the middle way between existence and non-existence, between permanence and nihilism, there is appearance which is empty. So your subjectivity is a process, a modality of, <clears throat> of your engagement, yeah. but it's not a thing. 
So now he's talking about, in the third line here, he's talking about mind and phenomena. Non-existent, he's referring here to what you imagine is there, and the seeker, they are unborn and unceasing in the three times. Non-existent means they don't exist in and of themselves. They don't have inherent existence, but they do have conventional existence or an unfolding existence within the framework of interpretation, which he's describing is unborn and unceasing. Unborn means they have never come into separated existence. Unceasing means they show in endless permutations, in the infinite diversity of the potential of the mind. Unborn equals empty. Unceasing or unblocked or unstopped, as it, you can also translate it, indicates the flow of phenomena. We're back with emptiness and form, emptiness and appearance. You can't find anything, it's empty of self, and yet the flow of experience continues. So we, we experience this again and again in our lives. Life is ungraspable and it is revealed through our participation. <coughs> You go swimming in a pond. You can't grasp the water, but the water is revealed to you with each stroke you make. Your hands are going out, and it's as if it's separating the water, and you see the ripples going by on the surface of the water. Your legs are pushing back, moving across the water. You are moving in the potential of ungraspability, unceasing unceasing. So this is our life. We're just swimming in this sea of becoming, the ocean of becoming, of event and event and event and event. And, and the thing here, of course, is there is no swimmer. There is event in the form of a swimmer. There is event in the form of the water. There is event in the form of swimming. So the three wheels that we talk about or the three concerns, the subject, the object, and the, and the connection in between them, which is the engine that drives samsara, these are all illusory. I'm swimming in water. If I stop moving, I will sink. Then I will drown. So I need to keep swimming. And the water supports me if I push it, because the resistance of the water lifts me a little and I don't sink. So it's like that. Our participation is our co-emergent movement with all the other forms. It never stops. Even when you die, you're into the bardo and life is going on and the new formations and shapes are rising. It's just more and more and more. What's it for? It's not for anything. What's the point? There isn't any point. If you want a point, you can bring in a point. It's open. Have a point if you want. <laughs> it's like that. So he's very, very clear. Thusness does not become something else. It abides as it is, natural great bliss. So thusness here, they need or dish in need, means the undeniable immediate actuality. It's just, it's not a construct, you haven't made it, this is it, here we are. And this thusness of our existence, moment by moment, when we're not lost in thought or daydreaming, we're just with it, this does not become something else. That is to say, awareness does not become ignorance. It's not like Adam and Eve, were in paradise and then fell out of paradise. Thusness is always thusness. What 
ego is, is turning your back on thusness. Thusness is still there. Thusness is there. It's more like the story of the prodigal son. Why are you eating pig food? Come home. Come home. But where is home? Here. But where? Here. But where? Here. You can't find here because you've gone there. The prodigal son story begins two brothers, one dad. Dad, can I get my share? I want to go away. You've got everything here. Why would you want to go away? I want independence. I want to be my own person. Come home. There's your bed. Food on the table. But where are you? That's the thing. It's always here. But we are not here. We are not here. Here is here. Where are we? Where are we? It is the mediation of hereness through conceptualization which disguises the fact that thusness, hereness, this open house, this hospitality of the Dharma Dhatu is always available. You are where you need to be, but you don't know how to be where you are. That's enormously sad. And therefore, we spend a lot of time trying to be where we think we should be. So we go from one conceptual formation to another conceptual formation. And he's saying, open to the thusness. You don't have to do it. It is intrinsic. It is intrinsic means it's just here what you make is called a mess. A mess. Don't make a mess. Just be here. But I have to. Why? Because I need to accumulate the two accumulations of merit and wisdom. I need to finish my noon grow so that I can get the initiation that will help me do a lot of mantras, that will help me understand why I'm not enlightened. Why do you need to do that? Because that's the path. Where are you going to? I'm going to enlightenment. Is that far away? Yes, it's very far away. It's a very big journey and I'm a Heroic traveler on the true path. <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs> good luck. I think I'll just stay here. <laughs> That's what all these yogis are saying. They have also been on the path. They also got sore feet and sore arse. Walking, walking and sitting, sitting. And that's the story of the Buddha. Remember, we have to go back to it again and again. The Buddha leaves his family. He goes off on his journey, six years wandering around on the Naranjana River, which is not very hospitable if you've been there near Bodh Gaya. It's a hot, sandy desert with lots of thorny bushes, lots of snakes as well. After six years of austerities and trying and striving and going to different teachers, I'm tired, tired, had enough. Get some grass, nice soft kusha grass, puts it down. Some little sweet girlie comes and says, would you like some food? Oh, food, food, I've not seen any food for a long time. <laughs> Big bowl of sweet rice. <laughs> you want food, feel better. Oh, just sit here. I'm not going traveling again. I've had enough. Early retirement. <laughs> then, hello, we are the Maras. We've come to entertain you. <laughs> we do dancing and singing and the girlies juggle the thingies and you'll have a good time. And, but if you don't pay attention, the boys will come and fight you. They've got arrows and spears. Oh, I'm 
too tired. Just give us a break. Come on, just have my dinner. Leave me in peace. <laughs> so they're doing all this stuff. And he's sitting there. Oh, this is right good. Come on, come on. Touches the earth, leave them me alone, shut these bastards up for me. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Here we are. It's all right. He said, hey, how did you do it? I'm not telling you. <laughs> Brahma, all the gods come throwing flowers at him. Tell us, tell us. No. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually he tells them and they get a lot of burdens and he says if you're a boy become a monk shave your head then there's these monks and they go out walking about another knock on the door well, Dad, have you seen your monks? They're looking at the girls. <gasps> From this day on, my monks will look at the road when they're walking. Next day. <laughs> Buddha, some of your monks are asking for meat in their begging bowl. From this day on, monks will accept whatever is given to them. 50 rules, 100 rules, 150 rules. 200 rules, 250 rules, increasing. Then Buddha dies. All the monks are weeping, weeping and weeping, except one new monk at the back. He's, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> what are you laughing about? No more rules. <laughs> That's the story from Sialam. <laughs> <laughs> so that's very interesting. <clears throat> that's a whole story of progressions, isn't it? But the key breakthrough point is when he stopped striving. When he could see it's not up to me. <clears throat> because when I do things and I try... I make things, I make, I'm learning yoga, I've got my hands in the air for months at a time, my nails are growing and curling, and nothing is really changed. Whatever I tr strive to do and try to make happen <clears throat> is a construction, and it doesn't bring about a metanoia, a fundamental shift or change in my structure. And the paradox is the fundamental shift occurs when you don't do. Non-doing brings it. So we looked at these four, briefly, at these four yogas for Mahamudra. And the fourth is gomet, non-meditation. Don't try to edit the mind, develop the mind, change the mind. The mind is perfect as it is. And you'll only see that if you slow down. If you are up in a plane, looking out the window at Germany, you see things moving very fast. You come out of the plane, you get in a car. You think, ooh, ooh, lots of things happening. Then you come out of the car and you get on a bicycle. Oh, lots of things happening. Then you start to walk. Not so many things happening, but you see them more clearly. Then you sit down. Oh, then you give time to the tree, you receive the tree. You give time to the dog, you receive the dog. You have the revelation of what's there because you are there with what's there. But you don't get that in an aeroplane, nor in a car. Slow down, be with what is. Then, So he was saying, thusness does not become something else. It abides as it is, as the natural great bliss. That is to say, what is, is complete in itself, 
And this is the natural great bliss of the intrinsic satisfaction or the absence of either lack or excess. Lack and excess, as we've looked, is the kind of engine that drives the world. Lack is desire. I need something more. I want something more. <clears throat> excess is responded to with aversion. I don't want to be overwhelmed. This is too much. Leave me alone. Or I have to get rid of this burden of all this stuff that I have. And so we're pulled into dualistic reactivity. But when you have satisfaction, when you're at peace, when you're at rest, then you have this unchanging state. Then he says to the end of this section, therefore all appearances are the Dharmakaya, all sentient beings are Buddhas. The Dharmakaya is the mind of the Buddha. Dharmakaya is the open, empty awareness of the mind. The mind without furniture, but also the mind with furniture, because there is no opposition. All appearances appear within the mind, and the mind is open and empty. So although you may conceptually label something as ugly, or bad, or rotten, or horrible. That is a mental construction which does not speak to the immediate truth of what is occurring. Because what is occurring is appearance and emptiness. That's called the kata, the original purity of the mind, is everything which arises in the mind is intrinsically pure but conventionally can be turned into shit by your prejudice, by your idea. So once you add the idea with its heaviness, with its determinism, onto <coughs> this bright, shining, <coughs> momentary showing, then you have confusion. So these, remember, open ground, two paths. The path of awareness is aware of the openness of the ground and therefore is aware of the unborn openness of everything which arises in and as the ground. Unawareness is not to see the openness of the ground and to see things. And because there are things, you organize things according to like, dislike, good, bad, and all the ramifications. So this is the essential point. All appearances are not different from the mind. That is to say, all that you ever experience is experience and you won't get anything else. So you better like it. <laughs> There's nothing else in the kitchen and I'm not cooking again today, so eat your dinner. It's on your plate. Eat it. It's good. I made it. Eat it. I'm tired of being your mother. You complain about my dinner. If you don't like it, leave. Go away. I made it, it's good, it's food, I'm eating it, you eat it. It's in the Dharma Datu. That's what this house is called. We live here in the Dharma Datu. Your dad's a Buddha, I'm a Buddha, you're a bloody Buddha, so behave. <laughs> but mum, mum, can't we have Dharma chips? <laughs> So, that's what he's saying. All sentient beings are Buddhas. So, when you enter into judgment, you think, this person is beautiful, I really like them, this person is horrible, I don't like them. What are you talking about? You have a perception which you formulate according to your templates, according to your mental constructs, you locate that person inside your template where there seems to be a resonance which allows you to say beautiful or unpleasant. <clears throat> you, <clears throat> excuse me, you attribute that value, then you believe that the value you attributed is inherent in the person, and that's who they are for you. You say, wow. So much mental activity for no good reason. They're Buddhas. Buddhas come in all shapes and sizes, in all forms, 
There are Buddha dogs. There are Buddha young people, old people, friendly people, unfriendly people. That's why in the tantric tradition we have the mandala of the peaceful and wrathful deities. Very sweet, charming deities, erotically charged deities, very frightening, scary deities. And we say, we bow to you, we pray to you. You look a bit dangerous, but anyway, I pray to you. Because these are forms of light. Their ground nature is light, but they look charming or cheerful or horrifying. They are actually the same. Mm. These are the forms of the Sambhogakaya. This is clarity and emptiness. So it's the same with everyone you meet in the world. They are actually ungraspable luminous presences, but you, in your conceptual interpretation, come to the conclusion, I like you, I don't like you. And then you live in the prison, which is, the, which is created out of the reflection back to you of what you have projected onto the world. That's very sad. That's very sad. How can you get out of that? You thought your way into the prison. The prison is made of thought. And then you try to think your way out of the prison of thought. <laughs> it's very difficult. Very difficult. Because you, you get into the prison of thought by believing that thoughts tell the truth. So now you're trying to antidote thought with thought. It's very hard. You end up just getting a kind of conglomeration of thoughts. Just like when you're a child and you get old-fashioned plasticine or play-doh and you get some red one and yellow one and green one and blue one and ha after half an hour of playing with them they're a dirty brown. <laughs> That's what you do with your world. The brightness is gone because you were mucking about. I didn't mean to. didn't mean to spoil it. So that's really what he's saying. All beings are Buddhas. Be careful of your judgment. Be careful of your judgment. Your judgment shows you you. Your judgments are an x-ray of your karma. Whatever you think about someone else is your mind. If only someone had told my school teachers that, <laughs> my life would have been very different. They thought they knew me and I had a hard time. But if you really see that, everything is your mind. He's, he's mapping out a very clear sequence. All phenomena are the mind. All that appears is pure because of its pure origin. All sentient beings are Buddhas. So when you don't see that, you are enveloped in the artificial construction of the allocation of differential value. This is a wonderful person. This is a terrible person. And this it doesn't actually fragment the world, but it is as if it fragments the world. Because not only have you intensified the difference, uh, for example, you might look at the colors in this room and you see some people wearing pink or red or blue or green, and you could focus on that color and, and sort of turn up the intensity of it for you. You could have a whole experience of green and then pink and then multicolored, and these colorations would stand out. You'd look around the world and you'd just see clumps of color. And then you might decide you don't like the green, you like the blue. So you want to make foreground the blue and put the green into the background. So now you've got a differentiation of significance in the field. Nothing has actually altered. Everything is exactly where it is, but I like pulls things 
towards you and inflates them, and I don't like you, pushes them into the background. They recede. It's as if their life force is, is removed from them. So now you're getting a hierarchy. Onto that, you bring out your scissors and you trim around these things. Now we have entities with different value. This is all mental activity. You are doing this. You're doing it habitually. You're not doing it intentionally. It's not that you're a bad person, but you're caught up in the creation of the world you inhabit. So what he's saying is, if you relax and open to the ground, you realize that effortlessly, seamlessly, all appearances are the self-display of the ground, just like the reflection arising in the mirror. And if you stay with that, you see, oh, in the mirror, different colors, different shapes, they're all reflections. That is the, the key point, because that indicates everything which arises is equal in its illusory nature as the manifestation of the ground. The manifestation of the pure ground is pure. All sentient beings are Buddhas. We deny that they are Buddhas when we interpret them according to our projected values. Your hard work makes you stupid. This is a big message, huh? Eight consciousnesses, eight of them, and they're all rubbish. They're all rubbish. Yeah. One awareness, definite. <laughs> and you've got it, except you haven't got it, it's got you. You're already in awareness. What are you thinking about? But I enjoy thinking. I like to know who I am, what I'm going to do. This is all he's saying. Like it says in this prayer of Kuntizanko, one ground, two paths. Two paths. The two paths go over the same ground. You go out for a walk here, you go up the hill, you go into the forest, one forest, two paths. You're in the forest, two paths. Depending on which path you take, you see different trees, different shapes, and so on. Where are you? In the forest. Which forest? The forest! <laughs> doesn't matter which path you take, you're always in the forest. The problem is, one path lets you know you're in the forest, and in the other path, you're walking in your mind. You're walking in your concepts. You're walking in a realm of self-construction that stops you seeing the forest that you're in. That's the only difference. So that's really what he's saying. If you relax your relentless need to name things and shape them, you will find the self-revelation of the ground and you will find that you are part of the self-revelation of the ground. But if you insist on relying on concepts, they will lead you astray. Which is why we looked a little bit at the beginning about how the five poisons lead to the experiences of the six realms and you can read a lot about that. There's a lot of discussion in the in the basic Buddhist teachings. These are mind constructs. These are experiences. Everything is an experience. You cannot step out of experience. So I have a glass of water in my hand. So we can look at that and say, oh there's two things there. There's a hand, you can see what a hand is in this a glass, we take the hand and leave it, and then we put the glass back in the hand, we take the glass out of the hand. So there are two things there. I am holding the glass. That's an account. That's a description. That's a formulation, a narrative. I experience the glass. 
I, I lick the glass. I, I experience what it's like to lick glass. It's not the same as licking my hand. My hand feels different. There's little ridges on my hand. There's more taste. No, 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 no. <laughs> Something is there. What is it? Experience. I experience the experience of licking the glass, which is an experience. I'm not actually licking the glass. I'm experiencing licking the glass. I have never, ever been outside of experience. Experience is what there is. Experience is the marriage of subject and object. So in the tantric practice, you see the male and female deities in sexual union, zungjuk, inseparability, union. That's me looking in the glass. <laughs> Couldn't you get a wee girl? <laughs> but I've got a glass. It's all right, though. Experience. Experience. The thing. How do you get the thing? There are no things. There are no entities. There are no isolates. No separation. Nothing has ever, ever separated from the Dharma Dhatu. Everything is arising in the mind and the variety of the display of the unborn mind arises as infinite patterns of experience, weaving and moving and dancing and singing on and on. This is the Dakinis in the sky, moving and happy and dancing. That's it. It's not more than that. But if you conceptualize real entities, if you think I lack something and you want to get something, then it's a long journey because you start with delusion. Delusion is the psychotic one in the, of the twins. Born together, we have delusion and illusion. Illusion's a wee bit weird, but not crazy. Delusion is absolutely upfront nuts, out to lunch, mad as a hatter. Delusion is when you really believe it's real, I'm going to get it, I'm going to live forever, I'm going to be a success. It's amazing. Fantastic. Nuts. Illusion's a little bit more hesitant. Seems to be the case. Could be. Maybe. Let's see. Let's see is the best, most fundamental mantra of all. It's better than Omahu. <laughs> Let's see. Mum, can I get a bicycle for Christmas? Let's see. <laughs> can we have pizza again tonight? Let's see. Am I a Buddha? Let's see. Am I lost and wandering in samsara? Let's see. If you see, remember today we looked at Vipassana in Tibetan, Lakpong, best seeing. Let's see. If you see, you see. If you see, you're free. Whoopee! It's like that. That's maybe enough. It's a nice evening. Why should we hang in here anymore? <laughs> There's a lot to think about, a lot to practice. If you walk in nature, feel the impact of the shapes and the colors. Feel them in your body. Let your body move with these shapes. And see, I am in conversation with all the shapes of the world. It's not me inside this bone bag here, this skin. I am already part of the world. I am part of a duet, always dancing together with phenomena, subject and object, subject and object. And then you feel how the colors and the shapes touch you and move you, and you open and you close, and you open and you close, and this is life.
you are participating in the non-duality of the display of the potential of the unborn ground, which is the mind of the Buddha. And as he says, all sentient beings are Buddhas. Okay, we we'll continue with the text tomorrow. Hooray! 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 Hooray!